it is the dead of winter. Um, I know you boys are big into ice fishing. I am not big into ice fishing, although I do like to go ice fishing with you guys. I mostly like to show up at like 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, a few cocktails, everything for you guys to prolong the day and have a good time. Keep us in um, it. To keep it in it. Like, mm-hmm. I just don't have the gear for ice fishing. It's a lot. Like, if you don't if you don't ice fish and you want to do it properly, like, it's an investment. It's like anything. Like, if you don't fly fish and you want to get into it, it's an investment. If you don't bow hunt, but you want to get into it, it's like, you need bows, arrows, release, camo, trees, you know? So, I just... I really rely on you guys to like bring the gear for me and I know that you guys are getting out of the house early. So I like to show up a little later with a lot of food and anybody that brings food and some cocktails, you're always looked at as like, Oh, I love that guy. You know what I mean? Well, bring the food. So I just, we weathered a long, warm January, probably one of the most like warmest Januaries on record for such a I mean, dude, we didn't have snow on the ground. What we did around Christmas, then it all melted. But then we got a little ice. Things were looking up for ice fishing for you guys, and then melted. Like, you couldn't get on the ice. Well, you know, we've kind of gotten past that a little bit. So I know, like I said, you guys are big into ice fishing. I am not. So I just, were you guys able to mentally, like, did you feel like we weren't going to have an ice fishing season at some point? Or were you like, it'll happen, you know? Because we invest, you know, new electronics, tent everything and then you find out your three month season is like a month and a half and it's like a, it's a lot of money to spend to have like a very short quick season well hopefully you never know though like march we could go we, halfway we go, through april def- definitely. with with frozen lakes like it, definitely middle to late march it, we, we'll go by go, far yeah but it always fluctuates like you get off to a slow start in upstate new york with winter you could end up prolonging winter into april you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I feel like we always get at least 60 days on ice for ice fishing season, sometimes longer on the smaller stuff. But it, it's it's a lot of gear prep. I mean, uh, were you prepared for this season to, like, kick off, like, January? Or were you like, hey, I'm kind of happy, like, we didn't get the ice because my shit's just, like, everywhere and was not organized? I think it's always the week of. It's like always, you got your you first can, trip planned, and that's when you, like, start going. You can make it yeah. happen that quick. Yeah, as far as going through just gear going and stuff. through leaders and making sure your jig rod mono's up to par. Pretty much. And... I'm not a big tip up guy, so I just, I just use okay. Jig rods, so you use jig rods, but... but like to me conceptually, like you know the the sled, the shanty. Yeah, the the, the it's not bait, worth the... it if you're not fully invested though. That's what I you f- get a few tip ups and a hand auger, but you're gonna have a terrible time, right? And especially if you're jigging, like I just feel like it. You're never gonna have enough stuff. Like then you get all that stuff, it's great, and it's like, oh well, you should get a Vexlar. You know yeah. what I mean? And then you're like, oh, you should get a better one. It's, it's, like, it's never ending. Effect. It's a snowball effect. And then it's like, oh, you got to get out to bigger water. Well, I got everything. Oh, you need a snowmobile. That's what's nice about You know what I mean? Next thing you know, you're, yeah. you got 60 grand of shit yeah. that you're lugging around. That's basically where we're at. Then now. you need a trailer. The snowmobile is nice. Then you need a truck. Snowmobile. It's just, it's never ending. Of course, you could say that about anything, but ice fishing, like, you it need, builds you need on people itself to do more right? than other stuff. Yeah, it feel it like it does. does. It definitely does. You definitely want friends to kind of come together. Like last year, I got a gas auger, like a propane auger, and like it's the biggest upgrade I think we've had. Right. For guys doing tip ups, nice. it's nice to combine your stuff. Like, hey, yeah, you got a truck, you got a sled, I got an ice auger. You know what yeah. I mean? But you want to go? Yeah, I know what you're saying. If you do it yourself, you're in, you're into it's it. A like lot, two grand, right? twenty five hundred bucks to go in the hole all at once. Especially yeah. if you if know you other guys that are good, successful at it, dialed in, and you know all the gear that they have. Like, if you don't hang out with those kind of guys, you only got a couple guys. You all jig a little bit, and, you know, have a couple tip ups. Like, it's fine. But you start to know these people. Like I know you guys. It's like we got Vexlars, we got ice shanties, we got the jet sleds, we got. It's just like. Mentally, I feel like I need to catch up to you guys to where you're at to feel like I'm a part of the group to be successful. I know at the end of the day, a hand auger, some wax worms on a jig, you know what I mean? Go to a pond where you know there's some panfish, like you can get it's them. just whether you're comfortable. I just, I can't do it without a shanty. So that's why I say, like, either could I. It's not worth it to just get tip ups and like a hand auger. Again, I did I'll... the tip ups for like years and like, and just like suffer outside. Like, if it's like around thirty two, totally. you're fine. But below that, I my hands I know. just don't work. Like I, so. I don't ice fish, but I look forward uh-huh. to ice fishing if it's like no wind and above thirty degrees. Yeah. Then I'll come out with some food. I mean, we've done that a few times. It's fun. It it, is like fun. you throw down a bunch of tip ups for you know some pike. 
then you go jigging the whole time for for panfish you kind of mix it up the whole time i mean you kind of just you kind of whatever the weather gives you is what you do like if it's true. below 15 running it's tip tough, ups if running tip ups for even just like pike or something if you don't have a hole cover right it's, it's a grind it's just a pain every it's the thing with ice fishing is everything is fighting against you the temperature everything wants to freeze the wind it's going to freeze even worse the snow like the ice conditions you know is it slushy like there's so many factors in ice fishing that are going against you like in a perfect world it's like hey mid 30s it's cloudy there's no wind it's not snowing the ice is really nice like you don't have like slush like i've been ice fishing with with you guys before where it's like six seven eight inches of slush you're gonna have a heart attack and you're gonna have a heart attack lugging your stuff out you're only going 100 yards but it takes you 20 minutes to kind of lug through and get there and then if even the even the footwear uh footwear Mm -hmm. even your bibs you know what i mean and like this year like i know you guys have a lot of new stuff but you were looking at getting new bibs you know what i mean for ice fishing or you know a new pair of muck boots that are insulated it's just like it never and you see, definitely need muck boots. I mean, if you're going to ice fish, you need yeah. muck boots. Like that's just Again, like, you could say the same thing about anything, but I feel like ice fishing is because it's it is you know, it is fishing. I don't do it and it just it seems like a long uphill climb for me to have all the correct gear to do it. Just something to do in the winter. I know. I use personally yeah, I use winter as off season to prep for steelhead trout bow hunting, Sam, you know what I mean? I just it's like my time to like kind of use to get my gear together to tie flies pretend to spend time with my wife and kids so they're happy so when trout season does come around and i'm gone for like three months that you know they're they're like well he did spend the winter with us you know what i mean but if i just rolled right into ice fishing it would not be yeah like die hard yes die hard i just die hard everything the other thing about ice fishing too is you have to be there before sunrise yeah like or for, st- for like while I or stay or, into the dark, you know, for like that like early up, morning, late, but yeah, showing up to fish from nine thirty to two is just most not, of the time that ain't gonna work. It ain't. You'll no. get some fish. You'll get some, not, but I I agree. Those peak bite windows, well, depending on what you're going for, but you yeah, are correct. It just seems like for yeah. the jigging game, like it's so you have to be fully committed. Yeah, it's commitment. Like, yeah, it's, it's nuts. So in the middle of the winter. You know, anyways, well, I'm glad that. Out. Things have kind of progressed in terms of ice fishing season because it was pretty grim there for a while. Like, again, yeah. it fluctuates weather-wise in upstate New York. Like, you're like, oh, man, here comes the ice. We got ice. It's really good. And then all of a sudden, it's like 55, 60, 65, record warm. You know what I mean? And then it cools off for like a day. And then, it, you know, highs in the mid-40s and lows barely around freezing, that doesn't make ice. It just mm-hmm. melts it. So I just – I'm happy that you guys were able to get out there because I know it's an investment. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of organization. And I was a little concerned for you guys that ice fishing just was not, you know, going to be productive. It didn't look promising. Um, so, anyways, other than that, um, I uh, am your Cortland line fantasy football champion, um, just so everyone is aware of that. First year that we've had a company league. I think we're going to expand on it a little bit next year, switch up the playoffs, add some more players. I was grateful to win this year. Uh, a little bit of controversy, um, not going to lie, with the uh, Bills-Cincinnati game. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I'm, I'm counting it, bro. I was impressed. I was, you know. I, I honestly I honestly ruled you out from the gate. There's – I. I, I ruled bro. you out. I ruled you out. How? I picked a good, solid team, though. I think it was just your. I don't know. I, I just did didn't. I just I didn't. You Matt, I, your team sucked, bro. Let's I just be didn't here. think you would be just. I don't know. I did have a great kind of week coming into playoffs and then the playoffs. I, you I do agree. Consistent. Like you they, stayed, you stayed on it. You stayed. The guys, consistent. they stepped their game up, right? And they they brought it. Had a good team. They brought it. No, I did. And honestly, like. I, I'm constantly thinking about like who I'm going to draft, like how I'm going to go about I mean. the draft. Like I know you went, you're like big heavy receiver, right? Yeah. I kind of was like, I'm going you know, well-rounded, like need a QB, need a good, you know, and it, it does work out. You got to get a little bit lucky too at the same time. You got to have guys that, you know, just start to play good at certain times of the year. So I'm just. Who was um, your QB? Who was your start? Patrick Mahomes. I picked him first. I wanted a good quarterback. I think that's why I ruled you out. You just, I've never seen someone take a QB that early. He's the draft. best quarterback. Bro, it's just listen. That's what I mean. So like, it's coming back. That Anyways, was, I just I'm sad in the sense that like it's over, but I'm more sad that like since September, I've been looking. There's two apps I look at 
constantly. It's my fantasy football app and my Moultrie trail cam app. And since deer season is done as fantasy football, like, I don't know what to, I go to those apps. Like, I wake up. It's just nothing it's, there. It's like muscle memory. I open my phone. I <laughs> scroll the next thing. It's those two apps. Like, did I get a new buck on trail cam? And who do I need to, like, swap out for my lineup? And now I'm not using those apps anymore. And I just, like, I'm like a lost soul. Like, I just, I don't know what, I need something different. I don't know what it is, but... I don't know. I just need something new in my life without fantasy football and deer hunting. Without ice fishing. Yeah. You got, I, it's fun it, being a fantasy manager. It is. It's neat. It's the first year I've ever done it. Me too. I'm glad I did is it. it? I, yeah. This I, was your first year I've too? never done fantasy football. Really? I was Me like, neither. it's one more damn thing I got to manage in my life. Between, yeah, you like, loved it. I, I did. I loved it was it great. Too. Like, I would literally, football. I would get in my tree stand in the afternoon. It was warm. It was a warm fall. I was like, I'm not going to see shit until dark. I was just like like go through players like look at recent activity like it's i great. had so much great. time to like sit there i probably screwed up on a couple deer hunts because i was so invested in my fantasy football app but i won't go there um so anyways uh welcome to the podcast everyone this is Cortland hooked the podcast I'm your host, Brooks Robinson. I'm here with my co-host, Matt Brovey and Richard Nicoletti. Uh, for those of you yes, sir, yes, that... Sir. And and I see Engineer Matt in the background, who's always here, by Raise the way, folks. He's pumping it up. We'll, we'll, we'll have him on. But you can uh, tune in and listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can go to our website and find our podcast on there which i think do does redirect you to the youtube channel so there's a ton of ways to find us what i thought was super neat is we have an alexa at home we have them in like every stupid room but i was like i don't know what is alexa amazon is Mm -hmm. that part i I didn't know that and i was like hey alexa play Cortland hook the podcast i was like watch this is not gonna work bro it pulled up instantly the episode that we did with matt procchio and bluefin tuna fishing and just immediately started playing it. And I was like, wow, we're going places, boys. Like, when my Alexa can pull that, I don't know. It was neat. Like, I just, I've never done that before. So, anyways, there's tons of different places that you can hear us, watch us, you know, just just tune in. It's pretty sweet. Um, like I said, the whole Alexa thing, I was, I was proud. I was like, we've come a long way that I can bark at my Alexa and it picks up, like, the podcast and everything. Um, so, anyways, we just went over ice fishing, fantasy football. Um, it's an interesting time of year. We're starting to do a lot of trade shows this time of the year. Um, I know what which one do you have coming up? The Denver Fly Richard? Show. Denver Fly Show yep. coming up. Um, which two is weeks. a big. It's probably next to the New Jersey Fly Show. It's probably one of the, if not the largest, consumer based um, fly shows in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is. I mean, it's probably second biggest next to you know like iftd slash icast as far as like the amount of people um really good brands there really good fishermen in that greater denver area and people come in from everywhere too so yeah i'm stoked this is my first time going to the show i remember yeah the first time i ever did that show i was like this this is awesome and we went back you know forever and ever so i'm glad you're going there and you have matt you and chris are doing what is the it's the, the greater niagara Greater show. Niagara Sport Fishing or Sport Show. Um, uh, yeah, something like that. It's in Niagara Falls, Buffalo area. Yeah. Um, and you and Rochford are doing that. And I'll be doing um, the Castafari Show, which is in Quincy, Massachusetts. It's just south of Buffalo. It is Boston. a very, yeah, or sorry, Boston, Buffalo. Um, just south of Boston. Thank you for the correction. Yeah. And it's um, kind of an offshore bluefin tuna, very hyper focused trade show. So, what's crazy about that is all of those shows are on the exact same weekend in later February. Was it the all very 18th, different? Nineteenth, completely different areas, completely different. You know, yours is kind of a mix. Yours is very fly. Mine is very conventional. Um, somehow we have enough trade show stuff to go to all three. Someone's no. going to have to. Scotty's going to have a rough time manning up the phones. So we'll we'll, cut, we'll get him some lunch. Um, I know they're on the weekends, but um, so anyways, I'm looking forward to those. We'll have a great time. Uh, special guest today, uh, Mr. Spencer Berman. 
is going to be joining us, who's been a part of Cortland Line since before I started working here. I believe when I moved up from manufacturing to sales, marketing, social media, pro staff type um, type jobs, I remember seeing a list from our sales reps of their local pros, their guys that they work with, and Spencer Berman was on that list, and that was you know eight or nine years ago. I'll ask, him, I'll ask him exactly when he was getting involved. So he's actually, as far as I know, has been working with Cortland before I started really yeah. working with Cortland. So he is a musky guide. He is a walleye guide. He is a smallmouth bass guide on, I believe, kind of the Lake Sinclair, Michigan kind of vicinity area, and we'll let him specifically tell us where he's at. So he's going to be joining us. I'm pumped that... He's on just because he's been with Cortland for a long time. But I'm also pumped for our listeners because we have not had that hardcore conventional musky guy on yet. We've kind of hit on some bass fishing, some tuna fishing, some fly fishing, some um, South Florida type stuff. So this is something new. So he's going to be joining us. Is he on at all, Mr. Matt Rush? Um, He's going to be jumping on here in a couple seconds. Matt's pulling it up now. I see you, Spencer. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear so me? So he's having, um, I think his, is he on mute? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. See if you're on mute, Spencer, because we can't hear you. If, 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 we'll get you clicked in here. Yeah. Um, what's, no what's, mute. It says it's not muted. All okay, right, there I can we go. hear you now. Yep. There you go. Perfect. What's up, Spencer? Can you see us all right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks Come for, on. thanks for joining us today. What, um, we basically get, your weather about 12 to 14 15 hours after you do because we're in upstate new york and you're like right straight across lake Mm -hmm. erie from us so what is our weather going to be tomorrow spencer what's going out in your neck of the woods right now we actually can see the sun okay the first time in a long time (laughs) it's been like vampire living over here but it's uh it's actually above freezing it's kind of it's in that crappy gray period where it's it, it, I just wish it would get cold for a little bit so we can have some yeah, seasons. Exactly. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, like I said, uh, our listeners have not had that kind of conventional musky hardcore. Um, and we'll talk about everything that, that you really do because you are well versed in, in your guiding operation. But uh, yep. I really want our listeners to get to know who you are what you do, all about your business, and then we'll kind of get into the details of, you know, really I want this to be more of a musky focus just because you are well-versed in that. Um, yeah. We can have you back on and talk about smallmouth fishing and walleye fishing and whatnot, but I think the majority of our um, consumer base, especially for the Master Braid side, is it, when you're talking certain colors and sizes, it's musky. We have a good musky following, okay? So that's really what I want to get um, to, to hit on with you being on the show but i want to go over kind of the basics like where were you born where were you raised spencer okay yeah i was born just south of detroit north of toledo kind of on the border right where detroit river and lake erie meet so for me the detroit river lake st Clair area is is home so i i did the i did the gypsy thing all over the country when i was young guiding just kind of following the bite and living in my truck kind of thing but uh i got i got lucky because i got to settle back here um that was kind of the big thing for me is that i always wanted to be here but there just wasn't the demand on the musky side from a casting standpoint gotcha uh, until a little bit later and that's that's kind of one of that's really what launched my career is i was kind of the first guy to do the open water casting thing here which is what kind of set the whole thing in motion yeah interesting and we'll get into the details that's actually really good to know so where where do you currently reside and when did you move back from doing your gypsy thing to where your current residence is today in general well, just like a normal gypsy, it's not that cut and dry. I kind of, I did like less gypsying for a little bit before I went straight here. But uh, the 2011, 2012 seasons when I, I, I was strictly on St. Clair uh, in 2011 for muskies. And then I started doing the bass and walleye in the spring in 2012 full time. Because I was doing Indiana in the spring because they don't have a muskie season. Because I used to just do strictly muskies. Like gotcha. back, back, in, back in my early days, if, if you would have told 22-year-old Spencer that he was going to make almost half his income doing bass and walleye, he told you you're on crack. Well, it, I was sh- musky only. Everything else is bait. I'm but sure. I've, <laughs> I, I've kind of become more well-versed and grown up a little bit. And, uh, you know, I absolutely love the bass and walleye thing here. And it's, you know, 
If you can catch muskies, they're easy. Did you start <laughs> fishing like when you were younger, when you lived, um, you know, where you were growing up? Was were you kind of doing the bass, walleye, and musky thing? Were you just doing bass? Was wh- like, what did you fish for growing up? Were you well versed, or were you kind of like hyper focused on like one thing? No, so um, I actually am one of the rare people that grew up without a dad that fishes that actually gets in the outdoors, which is rare. My grandfather was a big fisherman on my mom's side. He kind of got me into it. I I started out pond fishing, so obviously all doing bass. Um, we had a pond in our neighborhood, and that's what kind of set me on the path. And then, uh, you know, I started doing more and more bass stuff. My dad uh, is a contractor, so he would I'd work on his projects, and he'd always have houses on ponds. So that was my access point. I'd go and I'd, I'd push a broom for for work, and then I'd go and fish afterward. And then that kind of snowballed. I started doing junior BSS tournaments. Um, I did a bunch of those and, you know, that it kind of all, that's where the tournament thing all started from back when I was like 12, 13 years old doing, doing the junior BASS stuff. And then started doing my first musky professional event when I was 16 and, you know, took to it pretty quickly. That's so. interesting. I mean, I, I usually asked all of our guests and I mean, we're all boys here at work, but like someone's always going to get you into fishing, right? Even if you grow up on a lake, it doesn't mean you're born with a rod and hence it's usually a neighbor, your dad, an uncle, a cousin, but you said it was your grandfather, correct? Yep. And your dad was not into fishing. He was a working oh. that well, that's that's crazy. Um you you are you are right. That is usually your dad kind of gets you into fishing. Um, but you skipped that generation and went so was your grandfather did was he born and raised kind of in the general area, uh South Detroit, yep. kinda so he yeah, kinda... he was a little bit further south. He's Fremont, Ohio, okay. uh, which is be by 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 Port uh, Port Clinton, um, just a little bit inland from Port Clinton, but it'd be pretty close to all that. So he did Lake Erie and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I didn't really get to fish with him when I was of age. He he had Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, so by the time I was nine and ten, he was gotcha. kind of out of the picture as far as getting out in the outdoors. But he's the one that set me on the path for sure. It's awesome. So. Um, mm-hmm. What what year do you start? guiding like what is your official first guiding year is it right out of high school like you said you were doing kind of the gypsy type thing so i guess what is the first year you started guiding doing the travel type thing and then when is the first year you started kind of doing the guiding on sinclair um so the first year i ever ran a guide trip would have been when i was 18 um and then, and that was running overflow for other guys. Mm-hmm. I worked, on, I did a little bit working on St. Clair as a first mate, not running my own thing, just me and, you know, boat boy sure. and net and clean rods. I didn't do a lot of it, but I did a little bit when I was younger. I was unfortunately was a little bit too far away because I was like 40 minutes. And when you don't have a car, so that's kind of, that's a tough one, but yep. I did do some of it. And then, uh, you know, St. Clair, I got a captain's license basically as, as soon as I turned 18. I was like 18 in a couple months when I got a captain's license. So I started dabbling, doing a little bit. But unfortunately, when I first started guiding, um, my first guide trips were down in Indiana doing muskie there. That was when that thing was blowing up and it was really at, it was really peaking out. And it's a stocked fishery. So they all go through, you know, big ups and downs. Sure. And that was when it was, when it was really hot. So the demand was through the roof and a couple guys, I, I did some tournaments down there and some guys that were guides asked me if I'd have any interest in, you know, running overflow for them. And I said, you know, sure. So I, I got licensed quick and, you know, that was easy because it wasn't navigable. So it's even easier to get licensed than it is on, mm-hmm. on the Great Lake. And I started doing overflow for some of those guys and then started doing some of my own thing, obviously. The way all that kind of stuff works is they kind of subcontract you out. So you have to have your own stuff set up to, yeah, to do it. Yeah, I got you. What, what? at what point did you realize like you wanted to be a fishing guide, right? There's something that, like you said, you, you started right away. You got your captain's license right away at 18. So somewhere between, you know, I don't know, 13, 14 fit. Like at what point did something trigger you be like, this is what I want to do. I mean, this is your full-time job, correct? You are a full-time oh, God, captain yeah. fishing. Oh. So did, did you foresee yourself being a full-time fishing guide for the rest of your life when you were in your teens or like, what was the moment where you're like, this is what I want to do? Or d- were you not really sure what you want to do? You're like, I'll try this. And it just has snowballed into a, in a giant career. Yeah, to be, I, I'd love to tell you that uh, this was like my path from when I was 10 years old. And it was, you know, is all be all for me, but that, that wouldn't be honest. Honestly, it just kind of happened. Um, and I just, uh, you know, I kind of took to it. I mean, the tournament path is what really kind of set me this way where, 
you know, we started, I just started doing really well in the tournaments and uh, started getting a little bit of a name for myself. So writing for some people, doing some seminars and this and that, and kind of just fumbled into the industry. And, uh, you know, I was coming out of, I was coming out of college and, you know, it was, the economy wasn't great. And all of a sudden it's like, man, you can make decent money doing this. And, uh, you know, it's kind of built up more and more. And then as it builds, it becomes harder to pivot back into a normal job career when sure. you've got a hundred days on the water set aside. Um, so it, and it just kept going kind of. And the nice thing for me was I did guide basically all through college. So, you know, by the time I was done um, with, with school, uh, I, I was able to pretty much walk away and have a full-time job guiding a minimum of close to 200 days a year, like my first year when I was doing it, you know. Strictly. That's a lot. Yeah. So you kind of had a, did you have a clientele almost built when you were doing the guiding in college where once you're out of college, it was like kind of turnkey that you had, you know, laundry list of people to take basically. Yeah. So the St. Clair thing really blew up like right towards the end of, and when, when I was in school, um, what kind of, a couple things happened. Like we caught, uh, the biggest, still the biggest fish to this day ever in my boat, which is, you know, 55 and a quarter by just shy of 27. And it, I was wearing a, a hat cam just by some, some grace of luck and uh, caught the whole thing on film that blew up on, on everything. And then I filmed a television, uh, I filmed some TV shows with Keys Outdoors, who's one of the, uh, the two major strictly musky television shows. And uh, we had, you know, when Keys came there and we had just, you know, we had a uh, an unbelievable shoot. We ended up with just shy of 40 muskies in four days, uh, four over 50. Um, and he actually left a day early. The next day we caught 14 with three over 50 that day. If he, he was supposed to stay a day, but he actually ran out of tape back when there was tape involved. And, uh, but when those, when those four, four shows aired, uh, cause he turned it into four television shows, supposed to be one shoot, but we caught so many and he had had a kind of a slower year. So he ended up turning into four shows and when those came out, uh, I mean, kind of everything changed between, you know, people were kind of getting the picture that we were catching them casting and that there was some, a lot of big fish with numbers. Um, and then those shows came out and all of a sudden that year uh, at the the trade shows that season, um, you know, it was, it was like you flipped a switch. I, I used to have to kind of push, pull people to the booth. And now all of a sudden it was, it was a flood and my, my schedule filled up in no time. And you know, it all kind of snowballed from there. That's awesome. I mean, really good insight to the history of like, I mean, I don't know how you became who you are today. You know, and I was telling the boys, I think maybe you were lurking in the background, but how long have you been involved working with Cortland? Because when I had first started kind of on the pro staff uh, management sales side of things, like your name was on a spreadsheet before I started doing the job I'm currently at. So you got to be close to 10 years, correct? As far as... I I'd have to look back, but I bet you it's every bit of 10. Um, yeah. Cause it was, uh, I mean, I, I was kind of there through some of the turnover and sure. when it was a little bit, you know, I don't know. I, it, it you know, it, it, it turned Switching over hands. a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Yeah. I, I well, I'm glad that at least I was involved at that point where we kind of, I mean, we've been chatting back and forth, like I said, for almost eight or nine years. So at least you had some stability during like some management changes and some other things going on at Cortland, um, which mm -hmm. I'm grateful for. And, and you do a killer job for Cortland. One, um, you're very professional on the guide side of things. Two, you're very professional just in life in general. You're just a great person. So it's easy for us to partner with you. I mean, you give us a lot of great product feedback. Um, it, all in all, it's just, it's a, it's a really good relationship and, and it goes both ways. And you know, that with, yeah. with the rest of your sponsors too. So, sure. um, I want to get in a little bit more of like the fishery and the current state of the musky stuff, but just kind of a, a general background, like as far as your, your guiding stuff going on. And then we'll bump into that. Like, when do you start guiding in, in a given year? And what are you guiding for? Like, are you jumping right into musky? You jumping right into small off? Like what, what do you start and what are you guiding for? So we start on the Detroit River for the Detroit River walleye run doing strictly walleye the last week in March. I normally start right around the 22nd and 24th of my boat and my first guide trip this year is the 25th, which is pretty standard for me. You normally get about one week of, of decent fishing in Detroit uh, in March. Um, you can't, I mean, some years if it breaks up earlier, you can maybe get out, but uh then the whole month April is just is just nuts doing two a days every day um, for walleye. Awesome for walleye. Uh, all doing walleye, and then uh, May I rotate in the bass. I'm still doing walleye in May and June, but we add the bass in. 
Because that bat for the bass, you really need the lake temperatures to hit 50 degrees to get those smallmouth. And that's all smallmouth fishing. Okay. You need the water to hit 50 degrees to get those smallmouth in the shallows. No different than Green Bay or the other Great Lake systems. Yep. And it's it's an all catch and release fishery on the Michigan side. So I start doing um bass and walleye combo trips as well as strictly bass or strictly walleye for the whole month of May and most of June. And then uh, our muskie season opens the first Saturday in June on St. Clair. I the the casting bite and just the bite in general tends to be pretty slow then. So I've actually started doing bass and walleye for a couple more weeks and then jumping into the musky thing the end of June. And then I go till the 20th of December, basically. And when you that's was something I was going to ask. So it's uh, you said the first Saturday in June. Mm-hmm. I would assume in years past you would do like a hard stop and just start musky like guiding for okay. musky. What yep. what really makes that musky bite turn on? Like you said, I mean, it's got to be significantly slow for you. I mean, I, I, let me start with this. What is your favorite species to fish for? Is it musky? Is it walleye? Is it bass? Is it something else? Oh, it's it's definitely musky. I definitely have the most passion for musky. I love fishing in general. Sure. And, and as I've done it for, you know, 2,500 hours a year for years, you just you start to enjoy just being on the water and some of the, you know, some of the ease of, and the lack of physicality of some of the other species versus sure. the casting for muskies. Um, but I mean, I, I do love the musky thing. However, the, the way that our springs have fallen and yours are the same way. We Correct. just seem to, we're so cold in the spring and those fish until you get them about two to three weeks off the spawn are very hard to target for us. And uh, it just makes for really inconsistent fishing. You can do okay. And if we have a warm spring, it, it will it will be a lot better. Uh, but we haven't had one. We have not had a really good first 10 days of musky fishing in at least four to five years. Yeah, that's what I was um, going to ask in, you. In general. Like yeah. somebody maybe did okay. But sure. like in general, it's not been good. So, so the bass and walleye are awesome. Like that is prime time for smallies. And the walleye are still biting good. I mean... I think that May and most of May in the first two weeks of June, I, I never did more than one pass for walleye without having a full limit in the boat. So 18, 20, six per person, 18, yeah, I, 24, 30 in one drift, like literally an hour or less for six weeks in a row. Like, how do you, how do you turn that down? Well, just, you, you don't, I mean, and that's one of the things kind of where I was going with it is so musky is your thing as far as you know personal as far as guiding goes like you said there's kind of that daily physical grind when it comes to casting for musky you know yeah. there's there there could be less or more of a grind as far as you know the the small mouth and the walleye like what is your favorite thing to guide for is it musky or is it is it walleye because it's a little bit more fun it's a little bit more chill maybe it's not as not as a physical grind is it small mouth like I know you personally like to fish for musky the most, but as far as guiding goes, like it's a business at the end of the day. You know what I mean? You have to make a business decision as far as like these people are paying you money to take them out to go target a species to be successful. Obviously, you're going to do a little bit more walleye and smallmouth trips in that first few weeks of June compared to doing more musky trips because the the walleye fishing and the smallmouth fishing, like you said, are, are a little bit better than that early musky fishing. But in terms of guiding you know, what is your favorite thing to guide for? Is it, is it still musky or do you have more fun kind of BS and doing the walleye thing? I like doing both, but I mean, the, the bass and walleye, I'm, we make significantly more money. So if I was a better businessman and it was just more about, more about money, I would be doing, I'd be doing perch in October. I mean, running two a days for 600 bucks each burning no fuel not pounding your head against the wall, trying to get a musky to bite. Right. No, but the the musky thing is, is my favorite. I mean, that's, there's nothing else that gets your hand shaken like like a big musky coming up the boat. And that's just that's just what I, I really enjoy. Um, sometimes the guiding aspect and the challenge of the muskies um, on a day to day basis can take a toll on you. But, you know, with bass, if you catch 40 fish, it's kind of a slow day. So, right. I mean, musk one cast can make your whole day with bass. You know, you're you're three spots in and you got eight. It's like, oh, I, I can't just turn this thing around in one throw. So, I mean, it's from a guiding standpoint, it's both, it goes both ways. There's good and bad to all of it, but hands down, um, my favorite time to guide is the last month, month and a half of the season. It's brutally cold, but the fish and the muskies just get so fat in the late fall and you just have a chance that, you know, we're fishing for a lake record. I mean, the lake record stood for 
it'd be 16 years now, uh, the weight record. And I mean, that's my dreams. I want, I want to beat that record. I've what ordered is, with, what I, is that record for 40, what is, what 48 is five, 48, pounds. five pounds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what is, uh, is there a length record on that lake as well? Yeah. So there is a length record. That would be another goal of mine. My, my best friend, Jason Quintano has the lake record is 57 and a quarter. It was a summertime fish. So it didn't have the weight to be sure. the weight record, but, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, that that's the longest one ever caught. What are those, what are those, I mean, let's jump into it here. Like we've kind of gone over, you know, the intro, born and raised, the guiding, you know, which I, I want to give people a good background on who you are, right? So yeah. I think we've done that, but I want to jump into kind of the more, the the detailed stuff of, of the fishery, the techniques and whatnot. Um, like you said, that was a summertime fish, so it didn't have the weight. What are the fish on Sinclair? What are they targeting? What is their what is their preferred bait? Like what makes them beef up from the summertime to the fall to add that added weight? Yeah, I mean, we're a shad-based fishery. We have a little bit of everything, just like most of your Great Lake systems. And there's a lot of perch in there too. But shad is what really drives, you know, that, that's what drives the needle for us. So I mean, we're looking for big schools of shad. But I mean, the same is with all other fish. When you get, you know, your summertime fish, you're talking post-spawn. Um, you know, when they're coming off spawn, they're about the lightest they're going to get. That goes for anything, whether it's bass yep. or or, yep. or walleye. And then you add in the warm temperatures. Uh, and as the water warms, you know, their their metabolic rate increases. And, and overall, July and August are normally our highest catch rates. But that's partially because they're trying to put on weight after spawn when they're at their lightest. And then you add in the fact that you have, you know, a, a cold-blooded fish that with a high, you know, when the water increases in temperature, their metabolic rate's higher, they have to eat more. Sure. And the more, the more they have to eat, the more mistakes they're going to make, the more you can catch them. But in the summertime at 70 some degree water temperature, I mean, they're, they're like a professional athlete or an Olympic athlete where they can take in all the calories they want, but they can't gain weight. So, I mean, they, they'll have a little bit of a variance in the build. But when you consider how many calories they're burning, it's hard for them to get any sort of true mass on those fish. And like I said, you do the same thing with other species. And then once that water temperature starts to fall, their metabolic rate slows drastically. They have to eat less. They're not burning the calories. So it can make them at times tougher to catch. Um, What offsets that is sometimes they get more densely concentrated, but it allows them to put on a lot of weight. And that's that's really what makes, you know, that's what drives the whole thing. And if you want to look at it from a biological standpoint, um, the, the rough numbers, when the water's above 70 degrees, a muskie has to eat a meal every 24 to 30 day, or 30 hours, sorry, 24 to 30 hours. And then when the water is below 40 degrees, that same muskie has to eat the same meal once every six days. Wow. So um, you're talking a drastic difference. And that's what really allows those fish to put on that crazy weight and I mean, you, you'll see them put on, you know, some fish can put on as much as 10, 12 pounds. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a big number that they can gain. Really so, good insight I mean, to that fish. I had no idea. I mean, you're obviously, you guys musky fish way more than I do, but that I makes a lot, that makes a, a ton of sense to be honest with you. So what you're saying is during your guiding, during the summer months, you're going to mm-hmm. find more numbers in your boat compared to the fall in general, Correct. Yeah, your consistency is way higher. So the big thing about the fall is normally my highest numbers day comes in the fall, but your consistency is just is is, is very very uh, uh very very inconsistent. I, should I got say. you. And that's because, like I said, those fish don't need to eat. So when when they do eat, a lot of them can eat, and you can get big concentrations. But when they decide in mass, like we're you know they're not going to eat today, they don't have to. You can't wait them out in the summertime. It's, you know, it's very, very rare for my boat to get skunked. I think I only got skunked twice, once in July and once in August. And we had multiple chances both days. Um, but the problem, you know, the thing about it is those fish have to eat every couple hours. Sure. I mean, once a day they have to eat and they don't all eat at the same time. So new fish are co- becoming active every couple hours. So as long as you can get around them, there's going to be some fish that are going to make mistakes. Um, so that ends up just upping your consistency, your, your good days are, are hopefully on St. Clair. We're lucky enough to have a lot of fish. So our good days are double digits and our, our, you know, our, our average days are hopefully, you know, two to six bites and, and you normally are getting something the fall, uh, you know, your consistency just goes, you know, just goes completely out the window and you're going to have you, two or three days where it's terrible. And then you might have a day where you get 14. Right. So, but if you do find them in the fall and they're hungry and they're grouped up pretty good, you can have a real, you can have a banner day. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's, 
Yep. That that's, that's what drives the needle. I mean, that, that's what we dream of is that those days, I mean, you know, I, I had a day this year where we, you know, we had, we had what, probably four fish over 30 pounds and probably three fish over 35 with a, with a 42 pounder. In a day. I mean, they were, just, yeah, they were just biting. And I mean, I've done a, and my record is 22 fish in a day casting. Um, and that was, we had, we had two over 50 that day and I think seven or eight over 47. Um, and that was a late October day, um, fall day. They were just concentrated at the mouth of a river. And I've been waiting for like, I think I skunked the day before I might've skunked two days in a row before that. But so the it was, was, was going to happen. The water was dirty. The fish were stacked. They, you, you, we didn't have the water clarity to catch them and the wind changed finally. And it's like, when these fish go, they're going to all go at the same time. And I showed up that morning. You take one look at the water. It went from chocolate milk to two and a half foot of visibility. And it's like, oh boy, it's today's the day. And and it was, I mean, it was hammer time. So, I mean, that's what you dream of. I'm kind of, I'm kind of getting gassed up right now. Yes. That sounds awesome. There's a lot of that. So does it flow out of St. Clair, the St. Clair river? Yeah. So we fish, I fish the St. Clair river a lot, which comes from Lake Huron to Lake St. Clair. Mm -hmm. Then you go through St. Clair, which is basically just, it's more or less like a flowage. It's like a giant flowage. Cause all that water flows through. Correct. And we, we, we turn over all that water, um, you know, just under once a month uh, for all of 274,000 acres. That goes into Detroit River, Detroit River into Lake Erie. Got it. So okay. we fish basically the whole thing. I've got just shy of 400,000 acres of water that I fish throughout the year from all the way from the mouth of Huron to the mouth of Erie is kind of where we so roam. I want to get back to Muskie in a minute, but that the geography of where you're fishing, it is very interesting because like you said, you're going from a massive... Uh, Great Lake in Huron. What's that? Uh, what's that port right there? Um, so yeah, Sarnia, Port Huron. Port Huron, right? And then yeah, Sarnia on the other side. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And then the Lake Sinclair, and then the Detroit River into Lake Erie. Your wall are. I'll go through each species, but your walleye that you're catching out of the D Detroit River, correct? Are those yep. migrating from Lake Erie up into the Detroit right. River? Okay. Yep. And then yep. do your musky. Are those just St. Clair fish or do they roam at all? Are they going up or down in, or do, do you not, is there a tagging system or? Yeah. So okay. that my answer to this question has changed, would have changed drastically if you'd asked me five years ago, but we've done some transponder studies since then, both the MNR and DNR have, I've helped them with both of them um, as far as getting fish for them. But uh, it's been interesting. So muskies especially inland muskies are very notoriously uh home range oriented where they go kind of in a bay and you know they might go from point to point and then around a deep basin but they don't necessarily have crazy large home ranges great lakes fish are totally different and they are more mobile than we had any idea and our fish we do have the majority of the muskies that are in st Clair do stay in st Clair, but we have a lot of them that roam like big distances too i mean it's just it's wild to see how far some of these fish go I mean, we had one fish in the DNR study that went all the way to Buffalo Harbor, just outside the Niagara River in one year, and then was back in St. Clair. He was tagged in October, came out of out of St. Clair in the spring, all the way down to, to Toledo area, Maumee, and then all the way across Erie and all the way back across, you know, going back west again, and then up Detroit River and back into St. Clair again in the fall. So, I mean, that's just an unbelievable distance. That's, I don't even know how many, you know, hundreds of, it's probably a couple, that's over a thousand miles, I'm that's, sure. That's absolutely insane. That's like, insane. if you, if you don't, if you're not familiar with St. Clair and where Buffalo, like, look at a map and look how far yeah. that is actually. And you're talking about a fish swimming and they don't all do that, correct? Is it? No, that, that was the furthest we saw any of them go. And the next year it went, that fish went into Lake Erie, but did not go I don't think it went past Cleveland. It might not have went past Peely, but it did go back into Erie, but it didn't go all the way to the Insane. east side of the lake. Um, but we definitely have seen there's a fair amount of fish that will use uh, the west side of Lake Erie at times. Um, it seems like that a lot of the fish that are in Detroit River in the springtime are actually coming up from Lake Erie, which is interesting because there's there's not really been a, a fishable population on the west side of Lake Erie. Okay. Um, that 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 has been published and there might be one but i i don't know of one uh but our saint Clair fish definitely that's their kind of their home base but they will migrate i mean around a fair amount that's, so that is really interesting that lake erie doesn't have that crazy musky fishery because i mean at the end of the day like it is one system it isn't you know as the crow flies i should say not that far from saint Clair. but does does that um I call it the ass and a Huron that dumps into the river. Does that have a musky fishery? 
No, that doesn't either. The Erie would definitely have more. And Erie used to have a lot of muskies, actually. That's the crazy part. Is back in, you know, go back 100 years, Lake Erie had a ton of muskies. Sandusky Bay and Maumee Bay were both commercially fished for muskies at one point. Um, And then when the the pollution got bad and rivers were catching on fire, if you know the basics of your biology, the further up the food pyramid you go, the higher the pollution gets, the more it wiped them out, took them all out, and they've just never really come back. And we keep wondering if it's maybe going to happen naturally. We pushed the Ohio and Michigan DNR to start stocking it, but uh, no, no success to this point. Um, but uh, when you get down to the southern part of Lake Huron, there's it's such deep, clear, infertile water without a lot there. Yep. Um, it really doesn't seem to support a lot. Um, the same thing with you know when you get up towards Saginaw, there's just there's a few mu- you hear like one or two muskies a year, but it's very very few compared to the Lake Erie walleye guys, they definitely get them more consistently. Gotcha. Not enough, to, not enough to really get me excited. You're talking most of your walleye guys are getting, you know, two or three a year if they're out there pretty consistently, which if you're running bandits, ripsticks, rogues, you know, for half the year or for walleye, you should be, you should be getting a lot of muskies. If there's yeah. a fish population, you'll find around. something. No, that yeah. I mean, those five so inch do- cranks, those muskies will eat them. Not, yep. not as well as our baits, but like they'll eat them. <laughs> yep. So the majority of your muskies spawn in the lake or do you think they go for a little, uh, little retreat? Um, so yeah, so the majority of the St. Clair population definitely spawns in Lake St. Clair. The St. Clair river, uh, would have a spawning population of fish from the lake to go into it, but it's so cold in the spring. That water from here on, because it's so deep and so clear, it takes forever to warm up. It's normally on like right around opening day. It's normally ten to fifteen degrees colder than the lake. So I think I think the fish that spawn in the Saint Clair River are primarily resident Saint Clair River fish, and they spawn significantly later than our lake fish, which is why we kind of avoid the Saint Clair River in the beginning. I don't I won't fish Saint Clair River normally till mid July because it's just too cold. Yep, um, and the fish spawn so late. The fish that are in Detroit River, uh, which are which makes sense, they're coming up from Erie. It's warmer in the Detroit River than it would be in Lake Erie. Those are definitely, for the most part, resident uh, Erie fish, it seems like, based on the tracking. So there's a few that come down from the lake, but not a ton. Uh, but mostly, the reason that St. Clair is such a mecca for muskies is that you have great spawning habitat around the entire shoreline. The whole perimeter of the lake, for the most part, is awesome spawning habitat you know, shallow flats, you know, with a lot of good spawning material that warms up nicely. And, you know, especially the South and East shore, it's just, it's a perfect spawning area for muskies. And you've got, not only do you have like spawning bays, but because of the, how shallow St. Clair is and how there's not much grade to it, you know, you, those fish can spawn for one or two miles at least, you know, in and out. So it's, it's just a huge spawning, you know, paradise for them, which is why we have such a huge resident musky population it's all native and never been stocked so do you guys deal with any um like issues with canada sharing the body of water in terms of like spawning habitat um regulations regulations? oh yeah well i mean not a not a ton until covid covid yeah i was gonna say covid didn't help that situation but go ahead no covid did no good things for that situation um that's a whole nother can of worms there i mean they shut us out for a long time and you know, were those were, the, were those fish unpressured because of that COVID situation? Where once they finally opened oh. it up, those oh, it was. I, I it guess was. I should say, like, do your fish get educated because they get pressured? And did that COVID situation once they release that, were the fish just like, or were the Canadian captains? Or, just yeah, were the Canadians hammering on them? <laughs> no, like, there's there's not a lot of Canadian fishermen. Honestly. Sure, they don't they don't have the they don't have the population for one, right. and and it also it's always been a more of a walleye first uh group of guys granted there is something don't get me wrong there's some uh, good canadian uh captains and good canadian fishermen they just don't have the same numbers of fishermen that we do um so no when they open that season i mean that was that was it was truthfully better than christmas Uh, we call it we called it christmas but it was it was like christmas but only no one had fished them for two years so it's not even like opening day where they haven't been freshered for a couple months and you got kind of slower than average conditions with the opener being colder and all that. This was prime season opened on August 9th. So that's like right in our pinnacle. And they hadn't really been pressured in, you know, in a season and a half more or less. And it was, I don't want you to, it was was awesome. (laughs) Go down the rabbit hole too much on this hole, but like for the people that are listening and don't really understand sharing waters being shut out, just briefly describe kind of what happened with COVID um, 
and like the what restricted you across the lake? Okay, yeah. So when COVID came in place, so St. Clair, the Lake St. Clair actually itself is is two thirds in Canada. So we only have America has one third of the lake, and unfortunately, we do not have the better half. <laughs> They have the better side by a large, large margin, especially when it comes to muskies. The small, our smallmouth fishing is very, very good, but they have the majority of the muskie and the walleye. The Detroit River, the Canadian side is definitely considerably better. That's split right down the middle, and uh, the and the Saint Clair River is split right down the middle as well. So when they closed it to COVID, they closed the waterway on the imaginary line that goes down the middle of the lake and said that even if we don't go to shore, we cannot be in Canadian water, period. So even though we were, you know, like the majority of our summertime fishing happens five to six miles offshore, that we could launch our boat in America, drive across the imaginary line, fish five to six miles out, you know, we're fishing more main lake, deeper areas. And they said that wasn't allowed. So we went, you know, uh, a season and basically a half uh, where we couldn't cross that imaginary line. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. That, I mean. Doesn't sound real. So what did you guys do? Did you guys guide? (laughs) It was just grind it out on the U.S. side. Yeah. Everyone lined up. It was was (laughs) the whole thing. I mean. uh, They patrolled patrolled that imaginary line. Did they not? I mean, I was reading reading things where. The, the, the Canadian Coast Guard is, if you want to call them. But, I mean, I read something that, uh, like, the U.S. guides, like, they couldn't they couldn't stand what was going on, obviously. You're trying to run a business. And I read that one of the Canadian um, patrol boats, like, ran aground on a sandbar, and everyone laughed at them. I read that. Um, I read that. Um, it, it was in America, too. Uh, oh, really? So, Even better. I mean, they would basically, they would patrol that imaginary line. Would they not over time? Yeah. Or? Oh, yeah. No, they did. I mean... I don't know how much you want to get into this, but like, I mean, a, I, a little, a little bit. <laughs> well, me, me and my buddy, Jason, unfortunately we caused an international incident when this happened, they, they issued 570 some warnings and they gave two tickets. I got one of them. Jason got the other. Um, they didn't target us at all. Um, neither of us had ever been stopped or given warnings before. I know several guides that had seven or eight warnings. The first year they were, the, the patrol boats were pretty chill about it. No one really wanted to enforce it. Right. The second year it got a lot worse because the Canadians went back into a lockdown and the, and they were telling their people they couldn't really fish. They were closing boat ramps down. It was a whole thing. And we were stuck between a rock and a hard place. We got to the point where our American side, you could see bottom in 20, like 21 foot of water. You could see the bottom. And the and for walleye, that's just the kiss of death. So they needed to put some heads on a stick. And you know, we were we were like five, I think I was like 560 feet over the line, about a mile from shore in Canada. And uh, you know, they stopped and we got we got $370 tickets, but uh they needed to shut everything down again. Make an so that was that was fun. Um they they definitely knew who we were and they wanted they wanted somebody big to to throw up there to show that they were that to get everybody else out. Because everybody was kind of flirting with it a little bit, and it's right. you know, it's one of those things where it's impo- it's hard to patrol. So you know, it was what it was. It was it was a low point of my career, but it was what it you know. Yeah, it well, it I mean, it's three hundred bucks to have a pretty cool damn story for the rest of your life. I look at it like that. Um, I mean, well, how many captains can say they caused an international incident? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not many. Um, all right, so I want to get back and that's great, really good insight in, as far as geography of like Sinclair. Like that, that was, I mean, that was awesome. It, it, honestly, I thought I kind of knew the general area of vicinity. I mean, I chased a girl in Detroit for a long time. I've gone over that lake, uh, that St. Clair River. I've seen like the deep um, butt end of Lake Huron where it goes into it. Like it is giant, it is massive, it is a lot of moving water, it's cold. Um, I don't know. It's just a, a good way to paint a picture of your fishery in in terms of kind of the layout of um, you know, a giant great lake, a river, Lake Sinclair, another river, and then another big great lake. It is it is super unique. It's kind of I mean, there's really not many other places in the world that are kind of like that. Um definitely not for muskie. So um before um I kind of want to get back into like the musky th- side of things like the, the catch rate, right? We went over like the seasons in terms of summer, in terms of fall, why you're kind of more consistent in the summer, less consistent in the fall, but can have like bigger days. Are there weather factors that play into having a good day? Are there moon? Fa- I mean, I always hear the moon phase, like 
are do those factor in? Like we went over times of the year, but I want to go over, you know, sunny, cloudy, rainy, windy, moon phases. Like, are there certain days that you can look on a map or sorry, and in, in a weather forecast and you should be like, this is gonna be a good day or this is gonna be a rough day? Yeah, so there definitely is, especially with muskies, but with all of them, you really can tell. Um so, I mean, I think the biggest thing in the summertime, we've got a couple different factors, but wind is probably our biggest one. So anytime you're dealing with a body of water as big as Lake St. Clair, we're talking 274,000 acres, 420 you know square miles, um, you know, wind is your biggest factor. You can't, if it's blowing, you know, north at 25 to 30, you know, you can't be on the South Shore. Sure. For us, the majority of the time, um, you know, we want to be fishing that South Canadian shore for muskies, or at least the main lake area is kind of in the middle. So the wind is kind of your biggest factor. The trick to it, especially with the higher water that the Great Lakes has seen lately, is that if we have a consistent time of no wind, the water actually can get too clear and can really screw us up that way. So light winds are always our preferred, nothing crazy. Unfortunately, Mother Nature loves to stick to extremes. Yep. But, uh, that's where the big boats and things come in. So um, wind direction, I'd say, is probably your biggest one. And and, and for us, particularly, St. Clair only averages, you know, probably, we're probably going to average about 12 feet this year based on the water levels. Um, we stir up, you know, fairly quickly. Um, so the big thing is the wind direction and wind speed and how that pertains to your water clarity. Got it. In the summertime, uh, for both, for actually for all three species, for smallmouth, for walleye, and for muskies, you're looking for water that's got some stain in it in the summer. A lot of times your stained water, you're never going to get much less than two to three foot of visibility unless you have some really extreme blows yep. that come through. And that dingier water will attract all of those fish um, without a shadow of a doubt. And then in the fall time, once the water temperature gets much colder, it, it'll hold a lot more sediment. The water's more dense. So then, you know, you're, you're, if you're casting for muskies, you're lo really looking for water that falls in that two to five foot visibility range. And a lot of times it can get a lot dingier and that it can get, you know, chocolate milk once we get to that late fall period. So it's all about kind of flirting with that good water. You don't want it too clean because they're too hard to, to you know, to trick yep. the bait fish bug out and you don't want it too dingy either. Got so it. That's, it's so that's kind of how that pertains to that is what really determines our good days. I got you. So it's less about cloud sun wind or sorry rain whatever it's more about water clarity in general i think clear for sure I, other places i've guided other places i've fished not so much right but like if, if you're dealing with most of your inland bodies of water they tend to be a lot more you know uh i'd say a lot more lunar driven and a lot more sun cloud driven but you have consistent water you know your inland lakes that are just a, a stagnant body of water yep you don't have a huge swing from 10 foot of visibility in an area to two inches of visibility in area in the course of an 18 hour wind wind blow right um here and when you're dealing with the great lakes that's always a huge factor so that's kind of the difference you know when i guided up on vermilion a little bit i mean you could you could almost mark on your calendars the days that you were going to get the big bites just based on what the moon was doing but the water clarity was the same every day interesting so, i mean it, it, it's a different it's a totally different system when you're dealing with a shallow great lake style fishery no like that this. makes a, a lot of sense because i know you know when we musky fish, whether it's like we have large rivers out here that we musky fish and those fluctuate on stream flows, right? If we get yep. a lot of rain, they go way up, but also the, the water clarity, mm -hmm. you know, it, the visibility goes way down. Um, you Just don't get a lot those of rain. numbers, 10 to 12 fish a day. That's what like, I'm saying. There's so, something different. And then we fish. also have big inland lakes, which like you were saying, Spencer, like, like Otisco Lake is one of them. They have a lot of tiger muskies over here. It's like 25 minutes up the road. There's not a lot of fluctuation with that lake, you know, in terms of like the, it's deep. Like it doesn't, you might get a dirty shoreline on one day a little bit, but in general, you know, I mean, it's consistent day after day. Well, we so have zebra mussels too. Though. A lot of the zebra mussels, but they do too. I'm sure you have a ton of zebra mussels over there in St. Clair. We started Dina. them. We, Start we, we like to pioneer most of the invasive species. Yes, to I, I know. Because of the shipping that comes through Detroit, like, you know, the first lamprey, the first zebra mussel. Yep. 
You what know, else you got for us? Stuff. Well, it, Goldie, yes, we, it, we like to test them out to see how they are, and then we'll let you guys know how scared you should be. We usually let we usually let the ships flow through New York up to your mm-hmm. end, and then blame it on you, and then shit flows downhill in, into our end. So yep. trust me, we, that that whole we know all about that. Just um, not the Asian carp. Whatever carp starts jumping when boats run next to it. Oh yeah, the they don't have those yet. Carp. Thank you. I hope. That's, yeah, that's still coming to Mississippi. Ho- uh, hopefully that, <laughs> that does not happen in the Great Lakes. That would be a disaster. Um, oh, but. God. It is really good insight. Like we generally look at a lot more moon phase type stuff where you said it's more clarity Um, for rivers. It's a lot, you know, high flows, low flows, water clarity, um, a little bit of moon phase if things are consistent. But um, it is unique, you know, as far as different musky fisheries and what makes those fish turn on, what makes them turn off as far as weather, water, water clarity, moon phases and whatnot. Um, Hold on. I want to add one thing. Yeah, go ahead, man. So you're, it's over clear. So when I'm talking about the moon phase is having a huge impact on it, I'm talking about the monthly moon phase. Sure. Because daily moon times, your 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 moon overhead, underfoot, um, you know, rise and set, those are something I look at every day because your conditions obviously for the day are going to be consistent. Um, but those are your peak periods throughout the day you should always look for. But when we're talking about whether the fish are going to bite. You know, this week versus next week, I don't get caught up on whether it's a full moon or a new moon Correct. kind of thing. Correct. So Those clients do a lot. What's clients but. do? <laughs> well, there's there's a lot of, uh, about musky fishing and moon phases that I think people just generally read into. Um, I also think when you book a trip with Spencer and you seeing his 50 high 40 inches consistently, you're, you're looking at every factor before going into that trip to mentally prepare and, and for what you're used end goal. And what you're used to in a musky fishery yeah. might have nothing to do with his musky. Yeah. So what you're saying is like, like you said, Spencer, there's a monthly, just reiterate what you said. You got the monthly moon phases, you know, new moon, quarter moon, whatever, waxing, yep. gibbous, waning. I'm, I'm going into science class here, which I fail. Um, and then you have your your daily moon stuff, you know, like you can have the sun and the moon out at the same time in the middle of the day. You can, you know, are you focused on your monthly moon phases or the daily moon phases or is it is it both? I just I misunderstood what you were saying there. So, yeah. So uh, and when we're talking about the key factors that I look for, you know, in the forecast that are going to make fish bite, um, I'm looking at the weather as opposed to whether we're dealing with a full or new moon, half moon, quarter moon. Got it. All right. The, the moon phases, I, they play a small factor at times. Sure. Uh, like sometimes a full moon could get you more of a night bite, you know, think general stuff like that. But as far as whether or not I'm going to have success in that day, um, you know, the moon phase has a lot less of a factor to me than the weather does. Got it. However, every day you're on the water, you have a sunrise, you have sunrise and sunset, obviously, or your, are your, you know, you're talking lunar, your um, solar times. Yep. And then also you have your lunar times, which would be your moonrise, moonset, overhead and underfoot, which Correct. basically is high tide, low tide, and then moonrise and moonset yep. roughly for, for inland stuff. And uh, those come out, those are every day for the most part. You can, you can look at, there's a bazillion apps look that you, you can look for. And just in general, for me, I'm always looking at when those times are and a lot, making sure that I'm on high percentage stuff, that I'm fishing the right hours. Cause like we'll, we'll vary our hours dramatically. Um, and I look at those every day. Those are always a factor versus for me, the, the full moon, new moon thing, is not something that I'm going to tell people like, don't book now. It's not a full. Sure. Moon. You're going no matter what I get it. Well, that's. And, and, and if you look back at my big fish catches, they don't line up with right. the monthly lunar table very well. They might line up conditionally. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, very good insight. All right. Well, I mean, that was, that was awesome. Um, I want to get into some of the techniques. All right. Yeah. Um, I am not well versed in musky techniques, uh, especially conventional side fishing. So, I mean, if I ask a stupid question, please don't laugh, okay? Um, but I, I think there's a lot of listeners out here that um, are into musky fishing, into conventional style musky fishing, casting for casting muskies. for musky. Yeah. yeah, we're talking a couple different things here that are probably going to have the same basic questions I am. So, um, I might kind of dumb it down. I'm sure you've done podcasts in the past for musky where. You get into real specific type stuff, um, which we can go down those roads a little bit, but we're going to keep it, you know, somewhat yeah. basic. Okay. And that's because yeah. I'm a basic dude when it comes to musky fishing. So um, trolling versus casting, right? You're just casting. When you're guiding, you're just a, you're just guiding for casting, right? Um, yeah. So 
my, my guide service has a, I've got a couple other guys that do trolling stuff, but yep. personally, I just, I just do, I just do the casting. Thing. What? I have trolled a lot in the past, but I, you know, we, we offer both, but for me, it's, it's a go down swinging scenario. So that was one of the questions I had before, but we kind of jumped all over the place, but your guiding, like you have a guide umbrella that's under the Spencer Berman name. Am I correct? Yeah. Yep. So and I've, how got, many I've got, how many other guys? Five, five, five. Yep. Got I have it. Five guys that I, that I give trips to that, you know, help me with overflow. And I mean, just as the years have gone on, the demand for, you know, my time is, is too great. I can't fill it. And I brought people in sure. no different than when I first started, I, I was taking overflow for other guys. And, and then on top of, we also try to offer different things. Like I used to do cast and troll trips where you do casting and trolling the same day, you cast so your arms get tired and you yep. go troll. Yep. Um, I, I'm more of a caster. So like I just decided a couple of years ago, I got two guys that are good at casting and trolling trips. I'm giving those trips to them and I'm doing the strictly casting guys. I don't want to bring 250 trolling baits along with an extra eight rods and boards and all the rest of it. You know, I, I just want to cast. No, that so, makes sense. Uh, I just, you know, you kept referencing like my guys, our guys, this trip, you know what I mean? I want, you know, people listening to understand like you have built such, I'm going to call it an empire because it is an empire that you have had so many people. I It, it is, I mean, I don't want to, you know, grease you up here, but I mean, you've, you, you, You've done such an insane job musky fishing and being professional at it that you've had so many people come your way that say, Spencer, I want to go on a musky trip with you where you've had to sub these trips out, you know, to your best, most professional, you know, coworker guides that are underneath you. So yep. I just wanted to make that clear what's what's going on. So um, as far as Lake Sinclair goes, what do you feel like is the percentage of the amount of people out there trolling versus casting like are a lot of people casting doing what you're doing are a lot of people trolling you're just the kind of the unique kind of dude in, the, in a big group or is it 50 50 well so the first couple of years i did open water casting because they've casted on st Clair, especially around the perimeter for a long time going back to um bob bruner is one of the famous guys been doing it for 80 90 years he, he passed away a few years ago in his 90s and he was still casting out there but they never tried never did the open water thing so my you know quote unquote claim to fame or one of the things that put me on the map in the fishing world was doing the open water casting thing when i first started doing it it wasn't an overnight thing like this this came about slowly through a lot of trials and tribulations and a lot of luck and just ending up in the right place but uh you know when i first started doing it you know you're going back 2000 probably 10 was the first year i was truly out in the middle of no man's land no weeds no nothing just casting kind of casting the trolling areas and the first couple of years I did it, um, I, I went like almost three years without seeing another caster. I mean, it was just me, myself, and I. It was, it was, it was fun. And the fish were really dumb. And uh, if I knew, if I knew more about it, if I knew what I knew now, it would have been even more crazy number scenarios than it was for me then. Right. Uh, ever since then, like if you go back to 2013, Chicago Muskie Show is the biggest show, biggest musky show of the year. Um, I was the only guy at that show doing strictly musky St. Clair casting in my, in, you know, at, at the booth, at the whole show. You go to fast forward two years later, there, there was nine guys doing St. Clair casting for musky. Now, granted, three of them are working with me. So count those as you will, but it started to blow up and more and more people jumped on, on the train. Um, I would say that nowadays, I would say we're probably the summertime. You're probably about two thirds. I'd say two thirds to three quarters trolling the fall. That number starts edging the other direction. And you probably get more casters than trollers. Got it. Um, just as the fish come closer to shore and they get closer to the rivers, it becomes a little more manageable for people in smaller boats rather than going, you know, I mean, my average run in the summer is at least 16 to 17 miles. And some people don't have boats for that. So as those fish start coming in tighter, you know, you're not as worried about being out there when the wind kicks up, things like that. It makes yep. it easier or manageable for guys to find them. So like I said, I'd say two thirds of the guys at least are in the summer are trolling um, in the, in the fall time that would probably break the other direction. Interesting. Um, As far as numbers is mm -hmm. casting more pr productive in terms of numbers than trolling. I mean, trolling is a little bit more like it is a little bit hands-on, you know, you have to set your speed, you have to set, you know, your depth, your plugs, you know, whatever, as far as trolling versus casting, what is a better numbers game? Um, is trolling just more like you're going to catch more numbers, but I, it's a little less, you know, hands-on or is, is it more of a, is, is casting more productive? And like you said, you were going out to trolling lanes and casting and you said right. you were having really good success. Is it because you are 
moving a bait a certain way and a little bit less inconsistent in terms of speed. Like when you're trolling, you know, unless you're doing the left, right kind of power up, power down thing, like you're kind of, that plug is kind of moving at a consistent speed. Did you find that you were successful going out to those trolling lanes because you were able to work your plug at a little bit different rate of speed than what those musky were used to seeing trolling baits? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, what we're using casting in open water for the most part is we're, we're throwing primarily big rubber baits. So like big bulldogs, big medusas, you know, pounder bulldogs, half pound, and then, you know, regular medusas, husky medusas, that kind of thing. And the way that you work those baits is with a pull pause retrieve. You're working them like a jerk bait. So that bait's going to jump up in the water column and then drop as you reel up the slack and then jump and then drop and jump and drop. And it's an action those fish have never seen before. They're used to seeing stuff go in a straight line. Sure. And you have to remember the majority of the trolling that goes on in this lake is is all, you know, mast planer board trolling. So there's no contour trolling. These guys yep. aren't weaving back and forth. It it takes them a half a mile to spin a turn when you're when you've got a 320 foot spread. Correct. So, so the reason that we're successful and 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 we have we have a better success rate um, on bigger fish. I would say in a like in a lure distance travel, so they're covering more ground, obviously, and they can come, they can contact more fish uh, because of that. But uh, we do catch a lot of very big fish because our lure presentation is so unique. So to answer your question, though, you know more which way or the other, um, it really depends on what you're comparing me to. So like when the professional musky trail comes out to St. Clair. Um, you know, they, they allow one rod and one lure per person. It's two man teams. And, um, the, you know, we, we want it casting. Um, and I, I believe almost everybody on the board was casting. I want to say there was two, maybe three trollers in the top 10. Um, so the casters did very well, but it was one bait per person, you know, and then, so two for the team. So you either troll two rods or you cast two rods. Right. Um, now, on the flip side, if you want to compare my boat's numbers, so myself plus normally two clients, so three rods that take breaks, have lunch, yep. do all this stuff, yep. versus a 31-foot Tierra with a captain, first mate, five clients, 12 to 14 rods that are covering four miles an hour, I, I can't beat their numbers. No. There's I can I can occasionally keep up with them on big fish. And like this year we did the we did the freedom tournament, which is the a big trollers tournament and you know, we took second place, myself and two clients, uh, fishing a big fish only trolling tournament. There we were, there was two casting boats in it. I was one of them. We play second. One of my buddies is a troller took first. It was cool. Um, and that was the, you know, kind of the first time that a caster had ever placed in one of the big trolling tournaments, which was, is a cool accomplishment. I'm, I'm fairly proud of. So in a big fish setting, if the fish get consistent in an area, you can do well, but the end of the day, they just, they cover so much ground. They're always going to, you know, you put me up against 14 lines versus three. It makes sense. Can't, can't, you can't make up the ground. It makes sense. So how do you originally get dialed in with where you're targeting musky today? Did you just stumble upon it? Or was it the case where like, you're like, Hey, I'm going to go cast where all these guys are trolling all the time and see what's up out there. Um, it, you know what I'm saying? Or like, yep. it, it kind of rolls into my next question. Like, is there certain stuff like, you know, where you're going to now, you've been doing this for a long time, but originally when you had started, was there structure that you were looking for? Was there a weed line? Was there a specific drop? Were you just going out and you're like, Hey, these guys are having success here trolling. I'm going to start bombing casts around. You know what I mean? Like what, what did you originally look for? Um, it, and is there structure weed line drops type of base? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I tell the story pretty frequently of like the first time I ever really did it, the, the epiphany day. Um, so to, so to speak, uh, it was early in my career. I think it was 2010. Um, we started out in the early spring. We were in some, some spawning bays, like at the fish were post spawn, but we were fishing spawning bays. There was still some fish around. We were doing well. Uh, but unfortunately it was a colder spring. The fish left the spawning areas in like mid June and, uh, and the, the weed growth, you know, and the, on the secondary breaks was just, was just not up yet. And, uh, and it was, it was proving to be really, really tough. Th at this point, this was like the first, second year of my career on St. Clair. So we, I was still doing cast and trolling trips. And, uh, so I, I was kind of, because I knew the casting bite was very slow around the perimeters in, in those areas. Cause there's wasn't many weeds up and things. I was pushing a couple of guys to do, you know, some trolling because the open water trolling out deep was, was hitting really good. And, uh, and I did, I did basically, I think I did two days in a row 
um, you know, with like with double digit fish trolling uh, in, in about 20 foot of water over a hard bottom area, six, seven miles offshore. I think we had like 13 one day and like 14 another, something like that. And then uh, the following day, I had a client uh, that was here for a couple of days and said, like, I, I the trolling does not count. I don't want to troll. I, I want to cast. We have to cast. And it's like, please, please, please let me troll. They're biting. <laughs> So, so we went back in shallow and, uh, you know, tried to, you know, some of the emergent weeds did absolutely garbage, like a couple follows, no fish. And, uh, and I, so I begged him that night, like, please, please let me troll. Like, I think my buddy Jason was out in a big boat and had like 23 that day or some, some insane number. And we had like two follows and it's like, oh God. So he, I asked him like, can we please go out in the open water and troll? And, uh, and he said, you know, he's like, absolutely not. It doesn't count. I won't do it. So I thought to myself, I'm like, man, like if there's that many fish there, like I should be able to go out and just zombie drift around, even with no structure, no weeds, no nothing. And given the fact that we didn't even catch one yesterday, like what do I have to lose? Yeah, what's it going to hurt, right? Yeah. So like where does, I, I've got a bazillion waypoints from this area. So let's just go in anywhere the waypoint cluster. I'm going to drift around and throw rubber and see what happens. And And the first drift we did, we caught six the next day. And we ended up with a, we had, I think we had like 11 that day with like a 52 and a 53. And uh, I called Brad Ruse, the owner of Musk Innovations, uh, that afternoon and said, and I told him, I said, I don't, I don't exactly know what I've figured out, but I think it's really important. And it, it kind of all snowballed from there, but it was a slow learning curve and it was, it was less genius than just total desperation. <laughs> Sometimes that's how it happens. I mean, honestly, yeah. I feel like most of our guests that we have on, we, we try to go through a situation like what you just explained. Like, you know, when we had Fred from Bannis on, we're like, what was that tipping point where like you made it? You know what I mean? And everyone kind of has that one story. And I mean, that's basically that story as far as like, how did you become the Spencer Berman? Everyone knows you today for casting for Muskie. And like you said, it was a little bit of desperation and, and, and a stubborn client that was like, I'm not trolling. I'm only casting. And, you know, here you are, what, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, and um, it's it's what you do today. So um, super interesting. I guess my last question as far as, you know, technique stuff goes, um, electronics, Ricky had brought it up. Electronics have come such a long way um, in, in every aspect of fishing with, with the exception of, I guess, fly fishing is still a little bit old school. But, you know, you have... You know, and we were just talking about ice fishing before you jumped on with with Vexlars and stuff like that. How much are you relying on electronics for fishing? Are you relying on electronics for for fishing? I mean, I'm sure you have you know a depth finder and everything, but now you're talking forward sonar, side sonar. Like it's just it's it's gotten out of hand in some cases. It's cool, it's helpful, it it does make a difference. But I guess back to my question, like. Are you using those type of electronics and how much are you relying on them, if any at all? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I'm a younger guy in the, in the, in the fishing world, like electronics are key for me. I yep. mean, that's, um, I mean, that, that's kind of my is all be all for me and, and trying to stay successful. Um, earlier in my career, when we first started doing the open water thing, the fish were so darn dumb that, I mean, it, it was really fun and you could literally drift through and if they were there, they were going to bite. But as we've educated them once, once muskies get caught a couple of times, it starts getting harder and harder to recatch them. And every year they go through that same cycle where they they'll get dumb for a little bit, but they get, they get smart quick. So, I mean, the, the ability to know that there's fish in the area and then be able to wait those fish out, it has really changed the whole game for us. Um, side imaging and the side, side imaging and not only just side imaging in general, but side imaging getting specific enough where I could tell the difference between a gar, uh, a 50 inch sturgeon and a muskie what was was huge because we have a lot of all three of those species there's more sturgeon in st Clair than i can even shake a stick at that's crazy uh, and you know they're everywhere and um but they uh, if you get ones that aren't crazy big they look a lot like a muskie right and we got to when when i run all hummingbirds when hummingbird came out with with the mega two was really what you know pushed us over the top where as long as i'm not getting completely thrown around in giant waves i can tell the difference in exactly what i'm looking at and then be able to say okay these are muskies that we're drifting over and, you know, we don't need to go somewhere else. We need those fish to turn on because muskies more than any other fish are so window oriented 
where you can go four or five hours where they're just lockjaw, then all of a sudden it's gangbusters. But you need to have the confidence to just sit there and wait those fish out or to say, no, they're not here or we need to go somewhere else. And then you add in, you know, the live imaging. And, you know, I've, I've definitely incorporated plenty of that into, into my game plan here um, and allowing it to, to really help me to dial in clients, especially to put baits where in the water column I want them to be, um, see how those fish are reacting. You, you also can see I mean, muskies follow like unbelievable quantities without even coming into the boat, which is something we, we had thought but never really had seen before. Where, you know, obviously we all know about muskies that follow all the way up the boat. You do your figure eight yep. and all that stuff. But like literally, you know, five to ten to one, um, they will come up, engage that lure for five to 50 feet and then fade off before you ever get close to the boat. And until until you had the live imaging, you never even knew those fish were there. Um, and that's been super cool to see how those fish interact with the baits. Try to maybe do something different to get those fish to bite right. or just gives you the insight that the fish are around, they're moving, they're just not quite on yet, and you need to wait, wait them out. So to me, I, I would tell everybody to, you know, get as many electronics as you can, you know, get get the newest electronics you can afford, and most importantly, learn how to use them because they they really help to to make your time on the water a lot more efficient and help you to land a lot more fish. I mean, good insight. I mean, that is interesting about the follows because like, you you only see what you see at the boat. You know what I mean? Whether you're conventional fishing, fly fishing, like you're like, ooh, I got to follow. Well, how many other casts did you have a follow and the thing just didn't come into sight? You know what I mean? And like you said, that kind of helps you. You're like, hey, we're getting follows. Do we need to change up, you know, cadence, technique, um, you know, lures, plugs, whatever you want to call it. At least it, at least it kind of gets your brain kind of turning that maybe we're not doing something perfect that we could change up and, and be more successful. I mean, dude, electronics have come a long way in almost every industry. I mean, even hunting, like remember years ago, I was kind of anti trail cam stuff for like bow hunting. And then I got one and now I have like nine and they're all cell cams. And like the data that you collect from electronics because of like the innovation and stuff, it's insane. Like it, it you know, timing of day, moon phases, you know, where you want to be and when, like, it's gotten to the point where like if I'm hunting a certain deer and I see that deer go by my trail cam before I go into that tree stand, I know not to bother because he's not coming back until until nighttime. If I don't see him before morning when I go into my trail cam or into my tree stand, there's a good chance that things gonna probably walk by like the patterning that you can do on both, you know, fish game, whatever it is. I mean, in some ways it's gotten out of hand, but if you just obsess over it, I mean at the end of the day, you, it, it is a business. You are you want your clients to be successful. So the more things that you can give those guys, you know what I mean, it, it, to having it's successful. The, it's just the confidence. I mean, yeah, it's, you're not, it is you're not casting for trout you're, you know, know. or perch. Like You want to make sure you're casting at something real. And uh, I feel like that goes a long way. It is Spencer pretty. being there being like, yep, we drifted over five in the last hundred We feet. don't need to go anywhere. We yeah. just got to wait them out. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And um I don't know. It's it, you could say that in any industry, but in fishing, it's gotten it's it's yeah. cool. I mean, if you know how to use it right, it is it, cool. It is, but yeah, like like you said, that's that's been a that's been a hot topic for muskies with the live imaging and stuff. And oh, it's getting like that with bass too. I mean, like the the live scoping. Like we have Travis Manson on, who does a lot of um, you know, live scope. I, I don't know if he does a lot of it, but it, it is a thing, and it was not a thing it's a like few fishing. years ago. Yeah, it's it's um and it's never ending and there'll be something in two years and four years and six years that doesn't happen today um uh, you gotta evolve with the times um i'm good on techniques or you, yeah. you got any other questions like that i kind of wanted to get in are you good man i wanted to get in some of the like a yeah. little bit more gear kind of related stuff I do something with the one line. uh one question i had was where did you know casting for muskies originate from you know just in general yeah was it was it, it a specific body of water was it lake st Clair or no, I mean, casting for muskies has been around forever. I mean, I, I'd say your, you know, your kind of beginning spots would definitely be northern Wisconsin. I mean, yeah. northern Wisconsin has always been, you know, kind of the, 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 one of the staples of muskie casting, especially. The muskie trolling stuff goes back all over the place, though. I mean, you know, your St. Lawrence has been around for, you know, one of the pinnacles of, of muskie fishing. I mean, the, you know, 40 acre shoal is probably the most iconic muskie spot you know, in the world, I would say there's been more world record class muskies pulled off that than anything else. Granted, not casting, but trolling. Sure. Uh, 
but then like Leech Lake would probably be the other one. I mean, Leech Lake, Minnesota is, is, was a huge one that goes back forever and uh, has a natural musky population. And the state of Minnesota has now used the Leech Lake strain to stock all of their lakes. So all the lakes in Minnesota are Leech Lake strain and a lot of other places have grabbed Leech Lake strain because they do so well and they grow big. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you're, you're Hayward, you know, Eagle River, uh, and then Leech Lake would probably be what I would call your, you know, your original musky uh, hot spots, especially for casting, um, going back, you know, a hundred plus years. But and also like Lake of the Woods and Eagle and some of the other ones too. I mean, there was two re world records pulled out of Eagle back in the you know the early nineteen hundreds. So I mean that you know it's been going on for a long time. But uh, some of the old reports though are very interesting. But those are where the most of them originate from. Makes sense. Sweet. Sounds good. A lot of history there that I didn't think about but um 100 years ago just yeah, fishing for anything yeah, like, exactly probably pounder. whittling wood down to make a musky plug with some yeah um i couldn't imagine yeah, they, go ahead yeah, get, you hook hook them and get them to the surface and they used to shoot them yeah exactly or, or spear them um so there, there's, you, you get up they, they the line wasn't good enough back then they didn't have master braid they couldn't keep them on, <laughs> on the line so the goal was always to pull them to the surface and then yeah, you have a 22, your buddy has a 22 and he's got to pop them before the fish has a chance to get off or break the line. There's a bunch of really hilarious old stories of guys shooting the line, you know, fish breaking off or his buddy had three chances and missed them. It was a 60 pounder, blah, we've blah, blah. We've come, we've come a long way as a society. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I want to get into, um, cause I know we've been grinding here for a little, a little while. So I'll kind of speed through a couple things. Um, I kind of want to get into some of the gear. All right. And these could be kind of one word answers or you can kind of elaborate a little bit. But I, I just want to give uh, our listeners kind of a general overview. Like you're very successful in casting for musky. Guys are going to want to know what gear you're using. All right. What reels are you running right now? And you can kind of plug your sponsors. Like I'm not worried about that. Like, you know, size of the reels, you know, brand of the reels, you know, stuff setup. like that. Yeah. cast. We're going to go over a casting setup. Like what reels are you running right now, Spencer? So I, I honestly don't have a musky reel sponsor at the moment. Um, I use Okuma reels for, for bass and walleye, but their musky stuff is a little bit lacking in my opinion. Um, so I use kind of a combination of stuff. My Still my favorite to this day reel is the Shimano Calcutta 400 TE. They haven't been made in 14 years, so definitely not plugging a sponsor there. But uh, I mean, they're a bulletproof workhorse reel. That's all. The big thing about it is it's metal. They got a lot, they're made of metal. There's not a lot of plastic in them and they last, which when you're, when you're doing what I'm doing, which I'm ripping rubber, it's you're, you're torquing every single pull, you know, once every second, second and a half, right. you're pulling against everything on that reel with a bait that weighs, you know, a lot of, I, I'm normally throwing pounders. So it weighs a pound. So it's really hard on your line, your reels, your anti reverses, your rods, everything. Um, the one that I like right now that's sold that I use a lot of is, is the Abu Garcia Revo Beast. Um, they've been very, very good for me. They've got a couple different sizes uh, and different speeds. For me, I always go with the, the larger size, um, which I believe are the 60s. Um, the big thing for me when it comes to musky reels is, you know, you got big heavy baits and good line, you know, like your Master Braid, you can cast those out a long way. And I don't want the spool size to be that impacted by one cast. Right. When you start getting the smaller reels, like if I give somebody a 34 inch per crank retrieve reel versus a, a 42 inch per crank or a 26 inch per crank, I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it because I want to present a lure at a certain speed at a certain depth. So I don't want a reel that when I cast it out, the first crank, it picks up 20 inches and the last crank, it picks up 34 like I want it to be consistent. So the bigger reels, you know, the, 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 the size sixties or the 400 TEs, the 400 conquest Shimano makes a good one too. Um, you know, those are, those are kind of it for me, but higher end reels for muskies too. Cause everything, everything is hard on them when you're sure. dealing with that big like that. Perfect. Um, okay. What rods are you want running right now? Um, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm running the Musky Innovations rods. It's a new rod series lineup that uh, we I started using last year. They came out um, last the middle of last summer. Um, it's made by the same guys that make the Bulldogs, which I've been with forever. Um, and they've, they've allowed me to be very um, involved in the production of them and, and making kind of a rod that I want. Um, I think there's a couple other good rods in the market, but 
truthfully, in my opinion, the musket evasions rods are the only ones that are truly set up properly for throwing big rubber, uh, especially in the warm water months when you really need to rip those baits and get a lot of action out of them. Uh, you need stiffer rods than really what is offered. And, uh, you know, they, they make a great, great rod lineup personally. What, um, what length in action are you running for pounders, um, specifically? So for me, I run nines. Um, I run a nine footer, uh, for, for blades, uh, I'm running a nine six. Now keep in mind, um, I'm fishing out of a, a Ranger 622, which does not sit super high. You know, I'm, I'm five eleven, so I'm not a huge guy. Uh, if you're six, six, then you could go up one. The only thing is that a lot of times when you get to the longer rods, when you're ripping rubber, the, the end, the tips start getting too whippy and you can't, it absorb. When you go to pull that bait, you watch that rod buckle. And what it's doing is it's absorbing the action that you're trying to get in that bait. Yep. So you need a rod that has backbone. So if you're a bigger guy and you want to go to the nine, six, that's fine, but you should probably go up a weight just to make sure that you have the backbone you need. Um, I used to run a little bit shorter rods and you could get crazy, crazy whip on like I had eight, had eight, three, four X. That was just, I called it my whooping stick. It was just, it's a, it's a short rod for musky, but it was, it was stiffer and a board. Um, and you get awesome action on them. But the problem is as musky's get conditioned, you start getting more boat side stuff and eight, eight, three is just not quite long enough. So the, the musky innovations, three X, uh, nine footer is my standard rod in the summer. In the fall, as we start, we slow way down our presentations. In the fall, you're not ripping as hard. You don't want the bait jumping quite as much. The fish are becoming more neutral and negative. With the colder temperatures, I downsize to a 2X rather than a 3. Stick with the 9-foot. Um, for bucktails and your straight retrieve stuff, 9, 6. Uh, heavy action is perfect for double 10s. If you're looking to throw something smaller, double 10s or medium heavy is perfect. It's great. Beautiful. It's great. Um, I didn't even know they uh, made rods over nine feet. Yeah, right. For, for it makes tens. There's, there's a fair amount of tens for muskies yeah, these that's days. That's crazy. Um, all right. Enough about everyone else's company. I'm tooting our own horn <laughs> right now. All right. Because because we have not covered this, but it it really is the reason why we have a professional relationship. Cortland, you, Richard, myself, Master Braid. Okay. How long have you been running Cortland Master Braid. I think 11 years. 11, 11 years. years. Okay, that's yeah. longer than I've been with the company. There is a reason why you run Cortland Master Braid. We have honestly have not discussed it, but you are a full-time professional fishing guide. Um, we do not pay you. You run Cortland Master Braid because I assume it has, one, never let you down. It is consistent. Like, tell the fans that are listening, like why Cortland Master Braid is so important to you when it comes to muskie fishing. Yeah, so it's really, really easy. Um, you know, Cortland makes a great product. And most importantly, when you're dealing with heavy rubber baits, um, I mean, you're dealing with baits that are very, very hard on that line. And when you backlash that line specifically, because you don't need 80 pound to 100 pound test to, to fight a, a fish that's 30 to 40 pounds. You need Correct. it for the cast. You need it for the casting. And we anyone that's ever been there, even if you bass fish, like we all know when you go and you throw a bait caster and all of a sudden it tangles up, you backlash and you hear that crap and that bait goes flying. And Cortland is hands down the best as far as not breaking. Um, and, you, you know, for me, you know, I, I get all my my baits free from sponsors. So I don't know if it's not a cost thing, which it can be to some people, but like when I get a bait that's hot, like every bait has an individual action. Every bait runs differently. When a bait is hot, I mean, I will literally cannibalize 10 other baits to keep that specific bait running. And this is coming from a guy that doesn't pay for them. They just, that is how important it is to get the hot bait running. This is why your, you know, your bass pros that you have on will get 30 different baits in the same color and find three of them they like because they all run differently. Hmm. So you need a line that is going to make sure it's not going to let you down and not deposit that lure in the bottom of the lake on the longest cast of your life because it broke halfway out. And Cortland, you know, a lot of the lake, a lot of the different lines out there are 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 maybe a little bit thinner in diameter, but they're they're also much more brittle. And at the end of the day, a smidgen of diameter is way less important than, you know, the ability to not break. And Cortland for me is the only line I've ever seen that truly just doesn't break. It doesn't wear much. I and mean, that's the other thing too, is, you know, when I'm, when I'm on the water, 
you know, it's not uncommon for me to do 29, 30 days a month with one day off, um, running 10 to 12 hour days. I don't have time to go home and respool, you know, on those, you know, in that scenario, I need a line that's not going to fade. It's not going to wear that I can keep running it. And, and also you'll notice too, that when you're doing what I'm talking about, which is the heavy rod stuff, you know, where those rods don't have much give, that's really hard on line. And that really wears line. And it's amazing how some of the lesser lines in the market just get worn so fast and are so dangerous then to run because they're so frayed. They're so beat up after amazingly short amounts of time. Um, and, and that's just never been the case for me when I run Master Braid. And that's why I've always, always been, you know, been, been with Cortland and run Master Braid on all of my stuff, including the Bass and Walleye as well. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm pulling that clip. I'm going to spend more. We're, that's going to be like our new sponsored masturbate clip. I mean, that explanation was, I mean, well, perfect because that's what I wanted to hear. But, I mean, it it is ideal when it comes to musky fishing. Cortland has always had a pretty good following with masturbate and musky. Um, and I have to probably would agree with it's because of those things that you just mentioned, Spencer. And, you know, that's that's one thing I get a little bit from – some customers that are on the fence is like, oh, well, this braid is, it's a little bit thinner. It's it's thinner than yours and it's still 80 pound. And like you said, there's kind of a give and take with that, right? Mm -hmm. Thinner is not always better. Um, and it comes down a lot to, you know, consistency, um, the coating, longevity. Like you said, as a professional fishing guide, you do not have time to go home and change your braid because it broke multiple times or the color has faded or you're getting a bunch more wind knots. Um, I don't know. It's everything I wanted to hear. Again, we do not pay Spencer. Um, you've been fishing Master Braid before these two clowns were out of high school and mm -hmm. before I even worked here. So um, I don't know. It's awesome. That's honestly, that's, it's why I like working with you. It's why Cortland likes working with you. It's why Cortland likes working with a lot of other of our pros is guys that actually firmly believe in the product because they use it day in and day out not because you're getting greased up, getting some free shit from time to time. Um, and that just makes me want to work with guys like you and others that we work with even more. Um, so that's, I, I just, you know, I want yeah. to go over the master braid. I mean, that's really why you're here. So well, I want to, I want to hear too. I know how clear the water is up by you sometimes. And you mentioned like the water clarity has a, has an influence on how well you do that day. Um, have you found the last 11, 12 years fishing master braid, the color of the braid itself is coming into play. Like, cause recently in the last few years, it seems like blue has been like the new color that musky anglers are now, you know, kind of slowly gravitating towards. It's always been the, we've always sold the bronze color. We've loved the bronze. We love the moss green, but like recently. Yeah, we, hearing... we do well with bronze. We do well with moss green. We've started to do a little bit b better with blue in the musky And I don't know market. if that's all just like a visual thing or if there's actual reason behind sure, it. Sure. It, it could be. laughing it's, now. It's a good question, it's, but it's I, I will idiot. say before you he answers this. Before he answers this question, that, that can't go on the air though. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll, I'll start with this. When Spencer goes, Hey, I need like some more 80 pound. He's like, send any, he's like, any color is fine. Don't, which is great. I love you. Cause you're not picky. So I sent yellow. He goes anything but yellow. Okay. So <laughs> go. All right. Yeah. Now I'll answer the question. So the, the, the reason that I started out with the blue a lot, I think before you were, were there, and the reason it was pitched to me is they said, I, I, they asked me what color. I said, I don't care. And they said, we have a lot of blue and it doesn't sell. And I'm like, well, I don't care. So right. send me the blue. Yeah. Um, and uh, and now it's just turned into a point where like in my guide service, I have other, my so many of my other guys, like they need a reel. They need a left-handed reel. They need this or that. So like some of our equipment becomes interchangeable at times. And I like the fact that I'm the only guy that has blue. Um, so I always know which ones are mine. So you get your shit back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I get my stuff, but we run, I mean, truthfully, I, I don't want a fluorescent color when it comes to, um, my musky stuff, but I mean, we're running fluorocarbon leaders. These are fish that love to eat within, you know, trolling within eight feet of the boat behind a propeller. I mean, they're not super spooky. Yeah. So to me, I, I'm not super caught up on the color when it comes to muskies. I, I would say that part of the reason the blue is selling is because I run it even though, and people think that's important to me, but the reason I do it is not for fishing. Um, when it comes to other species though, when it comes to the walleye and it comes to the bass, you're dealing with fish that are a lot more sensitive, to these type of things. And, uh, you know, I definitely do think that the, the color really does matter. Um, 
So like in that scenario, I definitely think the color is more important and like the, you know, some of the bronzes for the bass work really well. It also, if you, you know, if you've got a scenario where your leader gets a little bit short, which I love your leader material, your fluorocarbon leader material is awesome. Um, and your leader material gets short, you're in a hot bite window. You know, you want a color line that, you know, if, if you only get down to an 18 inch leader or two foot leader, as you keep retying that you don't have to take that 10 minutes to tie, you know, I mean, the line to line knots are all a pain. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you want to be able to keep fishing. So, and then the other one, when it comes to walleye, so for me, we're, we're all vertical jigging on the Detroit River. And, uh, you know, as a guide, when I'm vertical jigging on the river, I need to see everybody's line to make sure that everybody is vertical. Um, not only from a boat control standpoint, but I need to know if one of the people in my boat is letting their bait drag and is not, you know, not vertical anymore and need I need to reset him. Um, so I need a line I can see easily. So like your high vis white is, is phenomenal for that. And then you add in a nice, you know, a two to two and a half foot leader and it, it, it works, it works phenomenally for us. And, uh, you know, for those, the, the color is very, very important. Agree. Okay. Agree. Um, that was great answer to a great question. Um, uh, because color does factor into a lot of people's purchasing decision in conventional in fly fishing in what backing they choose, you know, it could be a, a fishery preference in terms of like, I want something neutral drab or I want something high vis because I need to see the angle mm -hmm. or I like something blue because my rod's blue and it makes absolutely no difference. So um, it, it is, uh, trust me, we, we get a lot of that, Spencer. Um, I, okay, last gear question, unless you guys got something else. You you kind of hinted on it before, but, but your leader setup. Your leader setup is very important to um, being successful for multiple reasons, but I'm sure a lot of people like, Okay, they get the real Spencer says to use. They get the rod Spencer says to use. They get the Cortland Master Braid because it's the best Spencer said to use it. But the leader setup, right, specifically for musky, like what does that look like? How, how about we start with this? What is your? Do you run just fluorocarbon or do you run a steel leader or a titanium leader at all? No, I run just fluorocarbon, but I use a couple different setups depending on what I'm fishing. Okay, what size fluorocarbon are you running um, in general? Multiple sizes, like, and what are those? Yeah, so it just depends, but the, the basic rundown, when you're dealing with big rubber, you're dealing with baits that have zero impact from the leader size impacting the bait action. So, I mean, you're dealing with these, you know, long, you know, big baits, long tails, all stuff. Yep. It all works fine. Um, no matter what your leader size is. And because of the pull pause concept and the up down nature of the bait, you know, those fish head hunt the heck out of them and they will miss them a lot. So you need a good big leader. So I run 175 with all of my, you know, uh, bulldogs and medusas, 175 floral. Um, with bucktails, it's a straight retrieve. They miss them a lot less and you get a lot more boat side. I run a little bit shorter leader. The, the rubber leaders are like a foot to 14 inches I tie them at. Mm -hmm. The um, the bucktail ones, I normally time at about nine inches and I do one thirty. And then once you start dealing with swim baits and or crank baits, then it starts getting a little bit, you know, then it depends a little bit more. Normally I'll do like a hundred to 130 floral, but, uh, definitely lighter stuff. And then the only thing I'll run wire on is your small swim baits because they do get real fickle about how they're, how they wobble. If you put too much resistance in front of them. Got it. So then like a short wire leader will work really well. The ones I tell people to buy is Stealth. I think Stealth makes the best ones. I get components from him and tie them myself, but mostly just so he doesn't have to give me le leaders. I, I like making them. So sure. that's what and I I'm, run. And I'm assuming you're crimping everything. Um, nope, tied. 175 tied. tied. What knot are you using yeah, for what, 175? Okay. No, it's, it's, a very, <laughs> it's a very good question um, because I know a lot of guys do a lot of different things. Um, but there's I, only one. I'm, I'm going to want to you know do whatever Spencer's doing at the end of the day. What is your knot? from fluorocarbon to braid so when you're dealing with muskies you're you're going to put a swivel on on the you know your your ball bearing swivel yep. uh, between the, between the braid and the and the uh okay floral. and then what is... a, a three wrap clinch knot is about the only one you can you can run that'll i mean that's the same one that all the leader companies would tie on them it's the only one that'll pull tight with that kind of size got it so. and that is the same knot that you're going to run from fluoro to your bulldog correct is a three turn clinch? Yeah, yep i'll run that on a clip then yep oh you're I'm running on a clip yep i'll run a i'll run a steel ring and then a clip got it 
All right. Good enough with that? Yeah. Makes I sense. Like All right, we're going to replay this and take mental notes so we're actually geared up for musky fishing the correct way um, when it comes to springtime. What kind of clips do you use? Yeah, what kind of clips are you using? That was my next question. Uh, I'll, I'd say the same ones that Stealth uses, the the Stalocks. Um, I'll, I'll use a Stalock 6 is normally what I'm using, and then I'll go down with some of the other stuff. Um, the 6s are big, and they're heavy as heck, but uh, for the big baits, it doesn't matter. Your bucktails are normally run a 5, so... Then with the so if I do if I ever do any like trolling or stuff like that I'll run a cross lock just because the the stay locks will can come off if you leave them unclipped but uh, the, so for trolling it's nicer when you're switching baits and stuff but uh, yeah for me it's the the stay locks cool perfect you guys got any more gear questions uh, these guys are gear junkies when it comes to musky I just wait for them to make all the decisions and then I follow in their footsteps when it comes to musky fishing but. I mean, I think that's pretty good. It. Rod, I mean, real line. The leader tails. setup, I was very interested in. I feel like the swim bait, the swim bait leader setup is unique because, like, you know, with like a, a glide bait or a swim bait, um, I feel like 130 pound fluoro would definitely impact the action versus like 80 pound or 50 pound wire. So you're really only running wire when it comes to certain baits needing the correct action. Okay. Yes. So Got like when it. I so like some of your smaller swim baits, your you know, your five, six, seven inch swim baits, they can get real fickle with if you put too much drag in front of them. So stealth makes I, I don't I don't try to crimp or pull any of those. So like I, I get them from stealth. John Betty makes, you know, like a five inch leader um that you can straight tie in front of with a clip um that works really well for those smaller baits that are are very, you know, specific about what you can put in front of them without having them lose action. Got so, it. and I, and I'll be the first to say like, I mean, when musky fishing more than probably anything else, like that little bit of action, you know, the, the difference between 90% and a hundred percent action is huge. I mean, it, it, it can be the difference between not, not catching nine fish versus 10, but be catching zero fish versus 10. So, I mean, those, so many of them get so specific. So don't skimp there and make sure you're doing it right. And, and got something that's going to allow your bait to work the way it's supposed to same with your line. Sure. So, um, cool. All right. I'm dude you're doing this is killer I love this podcast by the way but we have sucked up a lot of your time today um I think you've been on for like an hour and a half and I'm, I know you don't mind but at the end of the day um I know you got other things to do so um I want to wrap this up with like a couple other things you guys cool with that yeah. then um like I said you've done a phenomenal job uh I've learned a lot more than I ever thought I would be interested in for one and thought that I knew for two um so Let's let's do this. We get a re quarterly report from you, um, mm -hmm. but I always find it interesting, like in terms of your fish count. So end of the year report, fifty three fish over fifty inches. Correct? Is that just you, or is that your guide umbrella? Nope, that's my guide service uh, in general. I had thirty nine this year. Jesus, thirty nine, fifty a week. Doesn't matter. I think between the three of us, Matt, Richard, and I, I think we caught three musky last year. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're also, you know, slinging flies around, which, which doesn't help the case. So fifty a fifty a week. A oh, fifty a week. So you've caught thirty nine over fifty inches this past year. Your heaviest yeah. was forty one pounds, I believe. Yeah, yeah, forty one. And the longest was fifty four. Fifty four, correct. Um. Would you consider the 2022 guiding season a very good year, a standard year, or a below average year? Uh, I would say it was probably okay. Um, the way the fishery is trending right now, it, it, we're going to have more 50 inchers uh, in the next couple of years. We have, we, we have a lull in the system because of the VHS virus that came through in 06. Okay, which so, is what? Explain the VHS virus. So VHS is a, it's a blood disorder that came through the Great Lakes. It affected all fish species differently, but it hammered muskies. It, it was crushed uh, drum, shocker. They can't, you can't kill the darn things, but the virus knocked out 90% of them. Um, it, it knocked out about 50% of our muskies. And just like anything, when you deal with viruses, whether it's people, deer, fish, you name it, it's hard on the old and the young. And it, the old fish, those died off a long time ago. That happened in 06, 07, 08. But it also was tough on the younger fish that did not have fully developed immune systems yet. And now those fish should be the top end of our system right now. So right now, St. Clair, um, like my guide service had 52, I think you said, uh, over over 50 inches in my whole guide umbrella. Um, I think that we had maybe, I'm paraphrasing here, but I think it was six fish over 52. 
So when you look at the curve there, I mean, it's very, very small. Uh, but the fish that are below that 52 inch point are very well rounded. They're actually some of the biggest, healthiest fish I've seen because they've grown up without a lot of competition above them. Yep. And we don't have any other gaps coming up. But the next couple of years, we're going to see that 50 inch count. And we're going to see the mid 50 inch count specifically really go up. Because like I said, we're missing about three, I think about three year classes, not all of them. Like there's a few, like I got two fifty fours this year, but when you look at how many of them in, 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 in general are getting caught, it's just, you can tell those year classes are really light. Interesting. How, how old is a 50 inch musky? In general? It just depends, but at St. Clair, they say they average 12 to 13. 12 to 13. That's, that's their lifespan. I mean, that would be a 50 incher 12 to 13 years would be standard. Wow. That's and, I mean, hopefully, if, if nothing else goes wrong in their life, hopefully they're not done yet. Sure. Yeah. Um, were you going to say something, Matt? Uh, I was going to, I don't know if you said before, but what's your favorite size of Master Braid to run? It's kind of random, but I don't yeah, know if you mentioned Yeah, back to your a, question. I don't no, know if you mentioned a pound yeah, that, size that, there. that is very important. Um, like you said, you don't need the, the 101 30 to necessarily fight a 30, 40 pound fish. But um, as far as Master Braid sizes, what is your favorite in... Does should it or does it vary a little bit depending on waterways and where people are going to target muskie? No, actually, that's a great great question. So for me, I run eighty pound master braid for my muskie stuff exclusively. All right. So one of the things that people knock master braid for, they say it's a little bit bigger diameter. But in my opinion, I would put eighty pound master braid against any one hundred pound braid on the market. A lot of people upsize to 100 because they are worried about snapping baits off with 80 pound master braid, whether you I mean, I, I throw ultra dogs all the time, which are 19 and a half ounces. I normally add extra weight to them. If you're talking 20 some ounces. I, I've never broken ultra dog off. My, my line breakage is, is absolutely minuscule on the course of a year, given the hours I fish and things. So, I mean, don't necessarily put the diameter of 80 pound master braid against other ones. It's stronger than most 100s, if not all 100s. And that is really all I've decided that I need to use. If I were to do some spring fishing with smaller baits, I maybe would downsize to the 65. But given the the fish that I'm fishing for, the, the system I'm fishing, I don't ever do that. The only time I would say that I would probably upsize to maybe a uh, hundred pound is if I did any sucker fishing in the fall. Um, the, the snap and the impact setting the hook as hard as you can with a broomstick rod on a sucker can break any line so you need to go bigger and you're running you're only running a decent sized leader so it's not going to impact anything as far as the fish being skittish but that'd probably be the only time I'd, I'd run the 100 but for me the 80 pound is is absolutely perfect for for any decently heavy musky application short of you know small spring baits perfect sweet yeah it seems like 80 is pretty standard in master braid by far. i know a lot of other companies though everyone goes with 100 don't know many yeah. other companies yep. that people are using their 80 or trust their 80. Um, interesting. Thank you for bringing that back up, Matt. Um, here's a question I have. All right. You said you're a Mr. Gypsy guy there when you were growing up a little bit. What is your favorite place to target muskie that you have been to and why? Maybe it's St. Clair. Maybe it's not. Say, no, it'd be St. Clair. It'd be St. Clair. My, my, favorite, uh, my favorite way to target muskies is in the fall in the rivers in St. Clair, either, you know, in the St. Clair River or Detroit River. I, I love fishing the current. I love the way the current lays out and how predictable it can make those fish. I love throwing the big baits deep, getting baits down, you know, 10, 12, 15. Sometimes this year in the late fall, we were fishing 20, 25 foot a lot. Um, you know, it's just, it's a really fun way to catch them. And it's also a chance that, in my opinion, your biggest fish of the year is the, those, those fish pushing those rivers. And that seven mile an hour current is, it plays, you know, wreaks havoc on people. And it also makes, you know, it makes your boat control more important. It gives you an ability to, to, you know, to really do it right. And to, and to put yourself into positions to get those really big fish, cause they can get super discriminating. Yep. Uh, and it's just, it's just a lot of fun. And the more time you do it, the more predictable they seem to become. And, you know, the, the more you can kind of cherry pick them. So I just absolutely love doing that. You mentioned like that seven mile an hour current. And I only asked this because recently the Great Lakes water levels and flow, at least on the Lake Ontario end, like the entire issue has been kind of a shit show with what they called like the 2014 plan. Maybe that didn't affect Lake Huron into Lake Erie, but 
do those river flows and, and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I'm really just curious that like the, the St. Clair river and the Detroit river, are those river flows always consistent or when you get those, you know, high spring levels, obviously you're going to have more water on, on snow melt, but summertime when you're kind of like in those rivers a little bit more, I assume when the water temps are, are more reasonable for musky fishing, are those levels, do those fluctuate a lot or is it, do, do they, but the rivers are so big, like you just don't notice it. Does that make no, sense? I mean, seen, we, I mean, honestly, the, the, the flow through the great lakes in general is incredibly consistent. Like you never, I tell people all the time, like you, you know, the wind doesn't blow one direction. You go to Niagara falls and it's dry. Correct. Like, I mean, there's always flow and then normally the flow does not fluctuate that much. However, in the last, you know, seven, eight years, that is not really the case. It has fluctuated. Um, and given the amount of water flow we see, it's fluctuated an incredible amount. Um, so we've seen the flow go up drastically. I mean, the water coming out of Huron alone, coming through the locks there is just, has just gone up exponentially as they're trying to get Huron back down to normal levels. I, I believe this last year has taken all of the Great Lakes back down to a more, more reasonable level, but our flow has definitely changed and it's changed our fishing quite a bit. So it, it definitely has an impact. And, and I, I would say you probably could have guided, I don't want to step out of turn, but you probably could have guided the, the t- previous 20 years. Um, you know, if you go 10 years back, you know, go back another 20 and that, that 20 years, you would never have seen the impact of flow that we've seen in the last 10. Agreed. So, I mean, it doesn't change things. And, and we see it here in Lake Ontario, Niagara Falls and St. Lawrence specifically, but not mm-hmm. for another, you know, month, two, three months after you see it. The water takes a long time to get from Huron to Lake Ontario to, to the St. Lawrence, but our lake levels in the Great Lakes, because we see it a lot when it comes to the salmon steelhead fishery. Um, and also, um, you know, just like people's shorelines just getting mm-hmm. smoked during certain times of the year. It has a lot to do with uh, the shipping lanes in St. Lawrence and the shipping lanes in Lake Ontario. At least for us, those are the reasons why the 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 flow controls are a lot different than they used to. And like you said, the last, you know, seven years, but I know that plan had been implemented in like 2014 Mm -hmm. right so yeah it has been around seven years that like the lake levels which are normally like super consistent i mean for those of you that are listening that don't know how the great lakes are massive um and they do not fluctuate a lot so um it's interesting that you say that because we've kind of seen it here on our end like in new york state and st lawrence and and canada and whatnot um all right good good answer i didn't want to get off on a tangent there um, I want to wrap. You, you can tell people too. I mean, like I, I've guided, I've guided on St. Clair for 14 years, and I've seen the 120 year high and the 120 year low. I mean, so that's that's kind of a crazy I thing. I think we basically seen that on Lake Ontario in the last few years. Yeah, yeah. You um, you mix in some bad uh, storms, and... really bad storms. I mean, people are losing shorelines that have have houses built there for yeah. 250 years, yeah. and then this past year or a few years ago. The lake was so dry that um, Sackets Harbor, up where my family lives, like you had to walk a mile on sand to get to water. Like that's it was how gonna dry up. Remember? Yes, it, it was. <laughs> it's it's it's, gone. it's been bizarre, um, to say the least. Um, all right, plug yourself here a little bit, uh, Spencer. I I want to like go through um, really just plug yourself, plug your business. Um, where can people find you? Where can people um. Do you have a website? Do you have social media? You know, give us give us a hint. Like, where can guys look you up? Yeah, so I mean, I run Spencer's Angling Adventures. Um, we got a website, you know, email, uh, phone. Um, obviously, you guys, I'm assuming, will put up up on the screen. Yep. Um, but uh, you know, Spencer's Angling ADV at Gmail dot com or Spencer's Angling ADV um, you know dot com is my website. Uh, social media, Spencer Berman. Um, you know, also be at the trade shows, um, whatever, whatever works best for you. Um, smoke signals, you name it, but I'm normally pretty easy to find. Um, if you Google Spencer Berman, I'll come up every way to Sunday. If you put in Spencer Berman fishing, something along those lines. So got it. Um, what, what trade shows do you have coming up in like mid late February, March? Do you have any coming up in that time frame where people can, uh, swing by and and maybe see yeah, in so person. We'll, we'll be in, uh, yeah, if you're talking that time of year, the first week in, first weekend in February, we're going to be in Pittsburgh for the uh, uh, Muskie Max in, uh, in Pitt. It's just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, but it's the Pittsburgh, it's a, it's a, sorry, it's Pennsylvania Muskie Max. Uh, I'm speaking at it on 
I believe Saturday and Sunday, maybe both. Um, but it's always a really good show. We've got a good attendance and, uh, you know, it's definitely something to check out. Perfect. Cool. Um, this is really the last question because we're, you know, once we edit this and air it, we're going to want to tag you, but when are you going to get an Instagram? All right. I, I, I would like to do less <laughs> social media, not more. Yeah. Um, I hear you. So, yeah, I, I, I've been getting some slack from two of my major sponsors about not doing Facebook live stuff. So yesterday I did my first Facebook live in like six years. It was really good by the way. You did a great job. Yeah. I, I love it. It's awesome. More social media, yep. but no, it is on, I, I, in order to keep myself organized i have a very long to-do list for the winter and that is literally on my to-do list so this year it will happen all right there well i go. just i want to be able you know instagram's great you have a ton of sick photos good videos you know it's, our followers just see him with a 50 inch every month and they're like who is this guy? i know and we can only tag you on <laughs> facebook true. so we're wondered. just well, i mean you're helping us out by getting an instagram here that's that's all i'm trying to say and i'm just kind of giving you some shit here so um it's all, good. all oh, right I, my, my, my good buddy, John Hoyer, gives me stuff, crap all the time about it. And he posts more on Instagram than about anybody else. All right. So <laughs> hopefully this, maybe this spring, you can find Spencer, Spencer's angling adventures on Instagram. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, it's going to happen. If it gets on my to-do list, it happens. All right. I, all right. I, you said I, it's I there? I decently organized in that category. Perfect. <laughs> um, that's all I got today for you spencer i mean you crushed it today answered a ton of our questions techniques i'm sure there's people out there listening like i said that are kind of getting into the musky conventional scene that will, will definitely appreciate this um thank you for coming on thank you for being a huge part of Cortland. thank you for being super professional um you've you've always been you know good to us good to me since you know day one of me working here um i don't know keep up the great work uh, look forward to working with you in the rest of 2023 and wish you the best of luck on your, on your guide season this year. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for everything. I'm going to be, I'll send you guys an order here at some, at some point here soon, but thanks for, for always being there and helping me out whenever I need it. And, uh, if you guys ever want to do this again, like I'm, you know, the podcasts are easy, you know? Sure. So like whenever you guys want to do them, just let me know. Don't, don't ever hesitate. And I'm like, like I said, I'm happy to jump on when I can work around my schedule. But I mean, like I said, as long as, you know, so if you guys have got time, I'm I'm in. So I mean, even this spring, if you wanted to do one, I mean, I've got I've got a couple hour break in between trips every day. I could even do one from the car. I wouldn't be able to do it on Zoom, but I could I could at least. Well, get, what we'll get, get from you for our listeners and and our readers is uh, maybe before the season of Saint Clair musky stuff kicks off. I know we chatted about doing a blog, so um, we'll chat you, me, and Ricky. Uh, we'll we'll kind of put you know, an outline of maybe what we're looking for in a blog for our readers. So for those of you that might be a little, you know, you like reading a little bit more and, and you're interested in what we chatted about today, um, let's chat about doing that. We'll, we'll do a dynamite blog for musky fishing for St. Clair. Yeah. You cool with that? Good. And then like I said, you should do something on the Detroit river. We need to get more people out there. fishing there you go. Master break. We'll there's, more, there's more people on that river in one day than there is on St. Clair musky fishing all year. So it's a, it's a market. All right. Heck yeah. All right, man. I appreciate your time. Have a great day. Absolutely, Thanks, Thanks, thank you so much. Thanks, buddy. See ya. See you, man. Um, that was that was way better yeah. and way more interesting than I ever thought possible. To be honest with you, I mean, I don't know if you guys heard it or not, but my stomach started growling like 15 minutes ago. Did you hear it? It is lunchtime. <laughs> That's what oh, I mean. <laughs> I've just been looking at this lava lamb. Um, that was awesome. Just, I just I like. That was I, I've, I've followed Spencer ever since I started working here, but um, there's just, there's a lot that goes into that musky fishery. I thought I kind of was into it and knew more about it. I just, I don't know. It kind of opened my eyes up to wanting to know even more about it. I mean, 50 inch or a week. That's all you got. Dude, just know. the geography of that lake. Like when you actually look at that on a map, like the size of Lake Huron, the river of St. Clair, then St. Clair, St. Clair is like a pond compared to Huron and Erie in the middle of two rivers like it is very it's like a mini it's like a big cross lake yes it is a very big cross lake with yes you're exactly right it's just it's it's unique in the sense that like you're not finding many muskie in huron and you don't find that many in erie and in between those two places there's two rivers that connect this it's, kind of like pond sized lake i mean it's a huge lake it's like an aquarium day. i feel like and then it's just like loaded with musky like it's its own little world of musky um and like he said like 
musky are everywhere. I mean, we have them in St. Lawrence up here by us, mm-hmm. um, a lot of rivers. Uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, really well known for musky. Um, and there's musky, you know, what Indiana, Tennessee. I mean, there's there's they're everywhere, and people target them everywhere. And there's big ones everywhere. Virginia, you know what I mean, and on down the list. But the musky he catches, um, they have a specific look to them. I, I think feel he like he said like, his total was like seven. I think for the seven hundred and twenty three muskies landed for the year under his guide. Service. It's just like that. Like that's like, two a day, every day. Long. When you think about how many musky his guide he's catching and his guide umbrella is catching, it's like, is there anything left in that freaking lake for those fish to eat? Like, how many musky those guys are getting and how often they eat? Like he said, it's I mean, all shad. I mean, there's musky everywhere, but seven hundred and twenty three muskies in a year. I know. It's like. It's a lot. It's a lot. Two a day. I would like to, because we fly fish, we love fly fishing. Like, you're never going to be able to take him away from a guided trip to take us clowns fly fishing. But I would love to I'm just. I'm throwing a pounder. To I don't, get, I, I'm going out. I, I want to see a 50. Too, I wanna like, s- I just, I wonder, we, we didn't ask him, like, if there if there's any, you know. I, was, mean, I wonder if he's gotten any fly fish. You're on musky. He said his friend. You know, he Instagram said his, stuff a lot. Like, do you ever see, you know, St. Clair fly guys out there? I don't know. If I don't, I have no people. There's going to be a few, out dude. There and do it, but. Isn't Eric Krajewski a Lake St. Clair guy? I don't know. I know who per, you're talking about, but I don't. Pretty, pretty sure, sure he I'm is. Not, he he slays on. I the mean, fly. with the amount yeah. of musky he's going, you gotta your chances of catching one. What's well, also interesting too for like the fly side of it is he said like the deepest he's fishing is 20 feet, right? Which is like think of a 50 incher in 20 feet. Saint Clair is not like, that deep. You go to a Tisco and you're in 20 feet. You're like. I'm targeting the smaller muskies right now. Yeah, or you're just thick with weeds, you know, in yeah. 20 feet. It's just But it's you usually different. think like deeper. I mean, I don't know. Like it's, it's a great lake fishery. It's just it's in its own category. But for throwing a fly in 20 to 10 feet of water, like that's totally doable. It's just, oh, yeah. You just got to go out with Anything him. Anything in the sea. Uh, yeah, you just got to go out with him. Go find his line. And <laughs> um, yeah, I forgot to ask him if he gets trolled by people that like wait at the boat ramp, follow him out, follow him around. At first I thought it was the lake was super crowded, but. It's huge. It, that's what I mean. It's you, huge. you hear about how much pressure is there and you how big the water is. And like even that main shipping channel that everyone kind of like he was talking about lines up on still miles and miles and miles and miles of water. So it's a good thing. It's not. It's on a small fishery. I, I, doubt, mean, he, I doubt he's being chased around. Well, but no. And I'm it, sure I he's mean, dealt for with him it. to be that open about that whole fishery in St. Clair. Like he's probably content. It's like yeah, it's, it's just yeah, massive. Definitely. Like he said, he's running 16 miles. Yeah, that's not a sixteen mile run to get to where he's gonna fish. You know what I mean? Not every average Joe Schmo weekend angler has a boat to do that. They do, but when the wind picks up, are you gonna make it home or are you gonna spend the night in Canada, maybe for a few days because you can't get back to the US side? Um, I don't know. It was it was really cool. I'm super pumped that we did that. He is a busy guy. He does he's just this is like the only time we were gonna be able to get him on his kind of his winter off season. Um Hopefully next know. fall. We'll Hopefully be able to next fall. Yeah, we'll go over some other stuff. Maybe a little bit more techniques. I, I feel like we hit on everything though. Gear, um, techniques. You know, the fishery, the geography. I mean, it was, I mean, that's what we really wanted to do. Um, there's definitely that, some, just, that vertical jigging walleye thing is taking off. Um, we got some new shops along the river there that just sounds like that's just like the most consistent fishing. There's so many walleye in, in that come US. out of Erie into the Detroit River. It's a, if you look at his Facebook page and what he posts during walleye season, like when he says he limits out every, he limits out, like regardless of how many guys are on his boat, like that Detroit river is so stuffed with walleye at that time of the year. It is insane. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Erie's really known for walleye. Like they have a ton of walleye and I don't know, maybe they, there's sounds like there's a lot that go up the Detroit river during that time of the year. Um, when is that? March, April? Yeah, but May, they go up the, said? they go up the mommy, they go up. I mean, that whole area. Is they just do migrate the... a lot. Super interesting about the tagging of that muskie that went from the St. Clair to the Detroit River. Yeah, it's Niagara, got into that one. Into the Lake Erie. Um, I'm surprised there isn't, and maybe there is, but like more tagging of muskie in the migration of them. Like he said, it's you have to have a muskie in a certain body of water to be set up to migrate, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I always find that stuff interesting, like the bluefin tagging that we went over with Matt Paracchio, any species that tarpon tagging, like bonefish tarpon trust, the stuff that they do. Um, you definitely learn about a species a lot. Yeah, it's interesting to hear about Huron, too, because I know I was just talking to a guy that has a shop um, along that river, and uh, 
he made it sound like his fishing is year round, like that river just stays on fire pretty mm-hmm. much a year round. Um, and partially probably because it stays so cold. I mean, June to get out there for walleye, it's pretty late in the season. Yeah. You know, well, what do you say, 10, 15 degrees colder yeah, than the, yeah. the lake? So, I mean, those Great Lakes take, take so long to warm up. Um, anyways, very That's interesting cool. fishery. Super nice guy. I love Spencer. He's been a part of Cortland um, longer than we've all been here, to be honest with you, but I did, which I didn't know. He's yeah. been around a Master Braid for 11 years. Um, very good testimonial about why he fishes Master Braid. Um, like I said, we don't pay him. He's been fishing Master Braid because he guides every day. It's never failed him. It works all the time, and he doesn't have to go home and re-spool it. Um, he just doesn't have time to do that. So uh, pumped that he gave us that testimonial for that. Um I'm good on today's show, folks. Uh, thanks for listening. Again, you can join us on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon. Uh, check out our website. You can find uh, some killer blogs and our podcast on the website. If you have an Alexa, say, Alexa, play Cortland Hook the podcast, and it will immediately start playing, which I thought was super cool. Um, thank you, Matt, for coming in today. Thank you, Ricky, for coming in today. Uh, join us next time, folks, on Cortland Hooked the podcast. Mm-hmm.